left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards. As you all know, or at least as you regular listeners know, there once was a movie called Battleship that I have uh, discussed at great length here on the Sacred Cow Shipyards YouTube channel. Well, the opportunity has come up that I might as well make a tradition out of this kind of thing. So buckle the fuck up, fuckers and fuckettes, because here we go. And by here we go, I actually mean we're going to talk about the uh, the 2010 live-action Space Battleship Yamato movie. And I preface all of that information carefully, because I am not actually talking about the TV series Space Battleship Yamato, otherwise known as Cosmo Ship Yamato, otherwise known as Star Blazer, that initially aired in 1974, or the sequel series that aired in 1978, or the sequel sequel series that aired in 1980, or the animated film from 1977, or the other one from 1978, or the other one from 79, or the other one from 80, or the other, 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 other one from 83, or the most recent one from 2009, or the spin-offs uh, in 1994 or 2004, or the remakes in 2012, 2014, 2017, or 2021. I'm only going to talk about the movie from 2010, the live action one from 2010. That's it. I don't care if any information it is right or wrong compared to the other, oh my God, content. I'm only going to talk about what I see in the movie from 2010, the live action one. Cause holy fuck, apparently this whole like storyline was really, really, really popular. Great maker almighty. The reality is that I was just going to talk about the space battleship Yamato itself, just the ship and not the movie that surrounds it. But then I started reviewing the movie and realized that there was just so much to talk about. We might as well do this whole hog again. But again, as regular viewers know, I don't really do the whole anime thing. So I'm going to confine myself to the live action version, even though it is basically anime in a live action flesh suit. Very kind of creepy when I think about it in those kind of terms. Anywho, same deal as last time. I am not actually going to attempt to confine my commentary to the running timeline of the movie. It could be shorter. It could be longer. I'm also not going to give you timestamps, although I will give you screen caps to show you what I am discussing at the current time. Also, because I am a lazy fucker, I did not bother installing the Japanese language module for my Terran linguistification system. So everything I'm watching is going to have subtitles because, again, I am a lazy fucker. Uh, if you don't like it, I don't care. Oh, and just to be clear, in case you hadn't already picked up on this, I am not going to bother bleeping myself for this massive undertaking. It would simply take far too much time and basically be a waste of time. Because honestly, if you can't tolerate a little sailor punctuation in a video about a battleship, you should probably go find a video more suitable for you, like, say, Barney. And now, with all those prefaces prefaced and all those introductions introed, on with the movie. Now, the movie actually opens fairly impressively. It drops you straight into the action, quite literally, by uh, following some starfighters going up against some gamelous ships. I guess we'll get there at some point. Anyways, the Gamelus ships and the Humi Starfighters, which are clearly Wing Commander inspired, are currently fighting around what could be Mars and probably will end up being because uh, just the way the story works. Now, I'm not really clear why there are starfighters, given that the fighters are going up against much, much larger capital ships and there do not appear to be alien starfighters, so choices were made. But I will give the movie credit for one thing. Uh, the One of the capital ships that the Humies brought to the fight ordered the starfighters to clear the cannon trajectory. This is a thing. 
It's less of a thing now that you don't have battleships and your planes fly at much higher altitudes and much greater speeds. But back during World War II especially, and some during World War I as well, uh, there was a lot of concern that the fighters would be in the path of the ballistic shells that your very large guns were slinging almost over the horizon. And you didn't want a blue-on-blue -blue incident. Bad things happen when you do that. So the battleships coordinated with the carriers, who then coordinated with the fighters, and they timed their shots, basically. Or just told them to clear off and were about to level that grid coordinate. Although the Navy doesn't actually use grid coordinates, but you get my point. And here we see where an attempt was made. What you see right in front of you right now are the Humi ships, again in orbit around Mars, clearly. Going from line astern headed towards the enemy to line astern broadside to the enemy. This is technically a nautical maneuver for bringing broadside guns to bear against an enemy. It's not a good maneuver. Or, to be more specific, it's a maneuver with some drawbacks and some features. The big news is that the ship at the front gets to be the shield. Um, I'm going to simplify this down to two dimensions because I have a sneaking suspicion this movie will do that for me anyways. But back during the era when y'all's ships used to go banging away at each other with these big honking guns, whether we're talking about three pound cannon or 16 inch cannon, it doesn't really matter. This was one way to shield the ships behind you from the enemies in front of you. Because as you're steaming along a line astern towards some enemies, they can really only target the lead guy. I mean, they can get some like glancing blows at the guys behind him and everyone's always pointed at the enemy basically so the target profile is small which is where the problem starts happening aside from the poor guy at the front which is again where the problem continues to start because once you decide that the enemy is within range of your guns the natural thing to do is take a hard right or hard left and start bringing your broadside guns to bear except the problem in this case is you do it one at a time First the guy at the front turns and starts blazing away, and then the guy behind him gets to where he turned, and he turns too and starts blazing away. And you just keep lining up that way. This is a great way to get what's called defeated in detail. You're basically giving the enemy the perfect opportunity to pick off your ships as they approach and as they turn before they can effectively fire. Even your battleships of ye old big old 16-inch cannon era only had two, maybe three turrets facing directly forward. Their biggest capacity for throwing weight at other things was fully broadside. Which is why most times you try to set up the situation that you go from line abreast to line astern. Basically, at some point way before the engagement, you all set up that everyone is basically moving forward on the same line. And then when you decide that your enemy is within range of your guns, all of you turn the same direction all at once and start hammering away. All of a sudden, you can bring all of your guns to bear all at once, as opposed to one ship at a time. This is a great way of making a first impression, pun intended, on your enemy. Apparently, the Humies in this case chose the alternative. Which, well, I mean, Humies. And, well, I suppose the good news is that I was correct that we were currently orbiting off Mars. The bad news is, what the fuck is that? What? Uh, why? Where? How? Why? I... What? It's... It... 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 It's like someone took one of your surface nautical navy ships, wanted to make it as obscenely draggy as possible, and then somehow strapped rocket boosters onto it and launched it into space without any consideration for the fact that space is, you know, a three-dimensional environment. Why is all this stuff stacked on top of the hull? I mean, looking at the ones in the distance, they at least have a few turrets underneath, maybe? But why, though? I mean, at least the drives make a certain amount of sense, assuming we're not doing, like, uh, hard physics where you have to accelerate and decelerate. They might have inertial dampeners or something like that. Why does it have a mast? Like, seriously, why does it have a radio mast? I mean, yes, I know, radio antenna and all that crap, but you can just build it alongside the side of the hull. What? And oh my god, the guns are in, like, bunker turrets. 
You're going to tell me that thing has any elevation or depression at all? You're going to have to roll the entire ship for it to engage anything even marginally above or below it. That is not efficient. And is that a boat davit I'm seeing? Why is there a boat davit on a starship? Oh, man. I hope those are surface access ports and not like uh, shell ejection ports. Otherwise, this is going to be fucking hysterical. Let them get in close? But why, though? You're both at line astern across from each other. You're both at broadside ranges. You're shooting your broadside guns. I'm assuming that your broadside guns are very high-powered, and very long-range, and very low recycle rate. You only let them come in close if either your targeting software blows, or you've got some fucking bullet hose that can just annihilate them but has no range. I'm guessing that thing that took like half a minute to get on target is not a bullet hose. Well, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Battleship Yamato, okay. Um, those are at least interesting looking ships. They're, at, in fact, have at least two distinct classes of ships, as opposed to the Humies who appear to only have just the one. They are still designed on a basically two dimensional system. I mean, there's an up and a down, clearly. They're not spheroids or uh, cylinders or whatever. It's also interesting that the Humi guns did precisely dick to the alien ships. You can see the residue of the, the shock cannons that the Humis used dissipating on the big ship right in the middle of the screen. I mean, yeah, there's the explosions on the one on the left, but it also apparently doesn't take any damage either. I like the kind of like dome structures. I'm kind of curious if those are like detachable subships or just compartmentalization gone horribly, horribly wrong. They're vaguely organic, which makes me annoyed because that's just an overdone trope and organic ships are silly and stupid and gross. But all right, this will be interesting. And oh, look at that. The Humis figured out something went wrong. Shocker! And equally shockingly, apparently the aliens have broadside guns as well, although they're apparently not turret mounted, they're hull mounted. And those broadside guns have absolutely no problems punching massive holes in the Humi ships. Now, a few things I would like to note that I can't really photograph because can't really take screenshots of this. But one interesting thing to note about the special effects in this movie is that ship in the background of this particular shot that is for some reason like sinking whatever, two-dimensional Navy nonsense again. When the, the blue glowy shots, you can see one on the left, hit it, the hull actually, like, bulged out. This is actually how things frequently happen on not heavily armored warships. If they take a uh, penetrating round, or a time-delayed round, or a timed-fused round, however you want to phrase it. There's lots of bombs and lots of shells and so on and so forth that use this kind of technology. They're designed that when they hit, they don't go off. They hit, they try to penetrate as much as they can, and then they go off. So their initial hole is not actually that big, but then they explode, and the ship bulges outwards from there. So yeah, basically think of those as being functionally plasma rounds that somehow penetrate and retain their cohesion until they lost their cohesion, and plasma fight everything around them, and that massive expanding gas bubble just exploded inside the ship and made the hole just kind of like popcorn, only humans inside. So, you know, bad, supposedly, kind of, sort of. Also, oh my God, would you look at the prow in that monstrosity? Why is that there? Do they plan on ramming someone? I mean, the turrets are again way back there. Why does it have this big schnoz? Who knows? And of course, of course, of course, we have to have the ubiquitous being sucked out the side of the ship scene. I have no idea why this is such a thing. I mean, I appreciate that your species has trained your young to uh, appreciate how dangerous vacuum might be. It can kill you. It simply does not care. It doesn't care if you live or die. This is in gross difference to your oceans who actively want to kill you. But still... The difference between the inside of that ship and the outside of that ship is precisely one atmosphere, maybe even less, because, I mean, your ISS operates on a much lower level than that. So it's still 14.7 PSI at most. That's not enough to get a human being flying. I mean, yes, there would be a depressurization event. The guy would feel the air going past him. He would suddenly realize that he couldn't make noise and couldn't breathe. He'd also start getting cold. And he'd die. It wouldn't be like that. 
Also, if he's being sucked out the side of the ship, why are there still fires? I mean, would have been depressurized already. No oxygen, no fire. Also, also, why is the hull of that ship so thin? I mean, this is a warship, right? She's meant to take shots. Y'all apparently don't have energy shields in this universe, so there is, like, no armor there at all. There's, like, hole stringers and a hole and a passageway and equipment and stuff, but there's, like, no space for armor. Glass cannon, anyone? And then, of course, we had to have the Grand Sacrifice, because there's nothing you Humies love more than the Grand Sacrifice, where one of those ships went and used its hull to block the shots it was going to hit the Commodore's ship, and the Commodore was able to beat a hasty retreat. Now, my favorite thing about this particular shot right here, aside from the ship blowing up, which is kind of horrible and all that, you know, is that those turrets, those stern turrets, are actually tracking the enemy targets right now. They never shoot. Also, notably, these ships you humans are putting into space right now appear to have VLS cells forward of that nightmare center island thing where your bridge and all your turrets live. Those big hatch-looking things just behind the, the aft-facing lights on the forward section. Never used. Maybe they're escape pods. They look a lot like VLS hatches, but I don't know. And despite all that, all of the five inch guns and all of the anti aircraft guns, and I know that's not what they are, but that's what they look like on this bizarre ass spaceship island thing, were never used. They never tried to shoot down the incoming blast. They never tried to do anything. Why would you engage an unknown enemy at maximal range? And then, if you did that anyways, why wouldn't you use what defensive systems you had to, you know, defend yourself fucking humies man wait a second no 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 you didn't no 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 you are not telling me that the humi ships went from a line astern to a line abreast with torpedo launchers in their bows and they didn't actually use the torpedoes what in the ever loving fuck i mean i don't know what these torpedoes are i don't know if they're missiles or torpedoes or whatever but those scallop looking things on the forward bow section of this stupid warship are definitely torpedo launchers and it did not launch a goddamn single guided munition at the enemy warships and i just have to ask why i mean Depending on technology, torpedoes do have shorter range and some battleship guns. But still, you have a big boom. Maybe a fast-moving big boom. Maybe a fast-moving big boom that has its own countermeasures to defeat countermeasures that are meant to defeat it. Use the big boom. You know, the big battle one. And then, and then, and then, because this can only get worse, I swear to the great maker. Those had better not be Sea Wiz units mounted on the starboard and I assume port side of the ship, directly astern of the five inch adjacent guns. That's not how you use Sea Wizzes. That, the, mm, no. They're supposed to have a wide field of fire so they can engage targets from lots and lots of directions, not bunkered into the side of the ship where they can't hit shit. What the hell? You actually had anti-whatever systems that you didn't use. Also, why does it have railings? Also, why does it have a harpoon launcher? Also, what the fuck is going on with this ship? Oh, and of course, of course, of course, of course, this ship can't recover fighters. Lord knows how the fighters got here to begin with. Did they take like a day, multi-day, week, who knows how long trip out here in their stupid little cockpits? Who knows? Man, that must have sucked. But wait, it gets so much worse. Because apparently, yes, those are actually torpedo launchers at the bow of the warship in question. In fact, it might actually have backup torpedo launchers behind those torpedo launchers. Whatever. Anyways, the Gamelus people, organism, creature, whatever, took over Mars and started lobbing these quote-unquote meteorite bombs at Earth. And here comes one now. And this warship, this basically fully capable warship that just took a few hits and limped its way home, 
but still has like main guns operational and stuff will shoot the meteorite bomb down right before it gets to earth right not so much they let it go and splat because i mean that totally proves that you are totally invested in defending earth from this mysterious alien force you know nothing about the fuck is wrong with you guys now thanks to those meteorite bombardment things the uh, Ganymus or whatever the hell have been shooting at Earth from Mars. Apparently the entirety of the planet Earth has been irradiated, all the water has been boiled off, and all the humies live underground. Eh. I mean, okay, fine. If the the aliens, whatever the hell they're called, are throwing radioactive rocks, that would totally happen. And if they're selectively hitting like uranium veins in the Earth, that would totally happen. But simply whacking the crap out of a planet with rocks is not going to have a significant radiological impact. More of the problem is what you term as a nuclear winter. Now, again, wrong term because it's not nuclear caused in this case. It's caused by an asteroid strike, but the same basic premise. All of those astro meteors, asteroids, whatever you want to call them, hitting your planet would kick up an enormous amount of dust, dirt, debris, crap. And it would be floating in your atmosphere forever. Years and years and years and years and years. Hypothetically, this is what killed off your dinosaurs. It got really cold. They died. Because that's, of course, what that enormous dust cloud would do. It would choke off the solar radiation reaching the surface of your planet. So plants die. Things that eat plants die. Things that eat things that eat plants die. And so on and so forth. And bad things happen. Now, yeah, the atmosphere would totally go to crap because it would be just chock-a-block full of dust. And your pathetic little lung system things really do not handle dust very well. But still, the radiological aspect is kind of questionable in this particular case, unless, again, the aliens are specifically payloading the meteors with radiological junk. Now, the interesting thing is that despite hiding in the dirt like you humies frequently do, some humies go up to the surface to see if they can find reusable materials to, you know reuse and those scavengers that go up to the surface are where the movie actually gets interesting and odd and strangely accurate okay sievert the fuck is that right well it's complicated as always because apparently you humies simply cannot get over making standards there's a standard for this and then there's another standard for this and then we figure we should standardize the standards which leads to a third standard and off you go to the races anyways Sieverts are directly equivalent to what you might otherwise know as the Rontgen equivalent man or the REM. Sieverts and REMs are a measure of equivalent dose or effective dose of radiation. The bad stuff, the glow of the dark stuff, the you don't want to go there stuff. Now these are different from RADs, which you might otherwise know as grays, because RADs slash grays measure your actual absorbed dose. And basically, in that case, uh, 200 rads will make you sick, 400 rads give you a 50% chance of survival, and 1,000 rads, otherwise known as a killer rad, because, I mean, that's a pretty awesome name, will pretty much kill you outright. Now, you're probably asking what the difference is between an equivalent slash effective dose and an actual absorbed dose. It, basically, the big difference is that the effective equivalent side of things takes into account the biological effectiveness of the radiation. And that depends on the kind of radiation and the energy and the kind of thing that got irradiated. Like, if your big toe got, like, all the dose of radiation and none of the rest of you was exposed, you're going to lose that big toe. You're probably going to be sick afterwards but it might not kill you. Okay, so fine. What does this all boil down to? What are the actual numbers you should be concerned about? Because there's these fun little charts about like different kinds of radiation and how they're weighted and scaled for the sievert nonsense and different parts of human bodies get different weighting as well and so on, so freaking forth. Well, the obvious funny joke is that a banana equivalent dose is equivalent to 98 nano sieverts. Yes, bananas are, in fact, radioactive, courtesy of the potassium that is built into them that your bodies actually need. Which, I mean, is just all kinds of ironic when you think about it. The average dental x-ray will cost you about 5 to 10 microsieverts. A single full-body CT scan will run you about 10 to 30 millisieverts. And then once you get up to a full, honest-to-God sievert, that is the maximum allowed radiation exposure for NASA astronauts over the course of their entire career. 
To put that in perspective, a six-month stay on your current Claptrap International Space Station will cost you about 80 millisieverts. So, I mean, one full sievert will take you a minute to get there. Unless, of course, you were, say, close to um, the Tokaimura nuclear accident, in which case people got 10 to 17 sieverts. A certain individual by the name of Hisashi Uchi received 17 full sieverts and was somehow kept alive for 83 days after the accident. But realistically, 4 to 5 sieverts is enough to kill an average human within 30 days, 50% of the time. Now, that doesn't mean that if you survive 30 days, you're in the clear. It just means you're likely to die, 50% likely to die, within the first 30 days. Now, on the other, other end of the spectrum, a certain gentleman by the name of Louis Sloten, who is the second fatality by way of your demon core, received 21 sieverts and died shortly thereafter. On the other, other end of the spectrum, a certain gentleman by the name of Albert Stevens spent 21 years working on the Manhattan Project and all the various other plutonium injection experiments that came off of that, and he received 64 total sieverts over 21 years. Didn't die of that. Died of other things. Basically, radiation is weird and complicated and complex, and I am almost certainly dumbing this down so far that I'm getting some of it wrong. The point is, if someone is talking about full value of sieverts, you don't want to play with it. Now, that said, radiation in and of itself is not a bad thing. Like I said, bananas are radioactive, technically. Taking a flight on your pathetic little tin can aircraft exposes you to a significant amount of radiation. This is not technically a problem. And in fact, that six to eight hour transcontinental flight on one of your aircraft will expose you to more radiation than you would have received if you had simply lived next to a nuclear power plant, a modern nuclear power plant, for your entire life and never flown anywhere. Nuclear is not a problem. Massive quantities of uncontrolled nuclear is a problem, unless you want to weaponize it, and then it's a different kind of problem. But still, nuclear power is not something to be feared. Random pieces of 14 sievert metal in the ground is not something you want to go poking. Which, to loop this all back together again, is actually something the movie got right. The little detector device that was strapped to this scavenger's belt actually warned him that if he dug up that 14 sievert piece of lithium, I think it was, he'd totally die. And his response was, no shit. I mean, seriously. And then, of course, as these things go, not 30 seconds after the movie got something right, they go and make it horribly, 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 horribly wrong. Because while this scavenger's out doing scavenger stuff, some random vehicle just comes crashing into the earth and deposits this thing. Is it a warhead? Is it a weapon? No one knows, but guess what we do with it? Yep, you guessed right. We take it on board one of the few remaining functional warships that the Humies have, and it hacks the computers! Now, apparently, this is a friendly little device sent by some friendly little people. I don't, I don't know. But still, you didn't know that going in. Why would you take it on board the warship? Why would you put it anywhere near a computer? Why is it not being, like, dissected in some bunker somewhere? No wonder you humies are losing against the Ganymas or Galamas or whatever the hell they're called. And then it gets so, so, so much worse. Oh, my God. Okay, fine. This guy is the scavenger. He had been out on the surface of the earth looking for bits and pieces to collect to make things out of. I don't know. He the, Again, the surface of earth is heavily irradiated. He was wearing a full body suit, but those are his clothes that he was wearing underneath that suit. I, oh my God. Nope. 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 Because when the thing crashed, it blew off his helmet and exposed him to the outside air. And of course, all the humans around him naturally assumed that he got a massively lethal dose of radiation. Well, clearly they didn't actually conclude that because he'd be butt-ass naked and shaved to an inch of his life if that were the case. This is standard operating procedure for dealing with radioactive contamination. You remove everything you can. And then, once he's butt-ass naked and shaved, you scrub him with some really, really nasty stuff and really strong bristled brushes that are on sticks. And those guys would be thin, full bunny suits. Not just, like, the body suit, but they'd be wearing, like, the whole, like, I don't know, like, biological contamination helmet thing with the big face shield and the rebreather on the back and all of the protection and lead and crap. 
And there would be very large, very armed, very enthusiastic guards outside of the room that he was being shaved and scrubbed down in. And if he even so much as breathed about leaving that room, he'd be cordially reminded that he needed to stay in that room. Radioactive contamination is no joke, and yes, the lady chasing after him with her head hanging out of her suit is totally right. He would totally be contaminating the entire ship right now. This is not how you do this. Now, as it turns out, he should have been dead by now, given the dose he received, but I suppose we'll get to that. Regardless, yes, congratulations, everything he walked past, everyone he came in contact with, those three technicians, and soon everyone on this bridge have been at least exposed to a hot item and may end up having radiological materials shed all over them, which means they'll have to, like, dispose of their own clothing appropriately. This is just ridiculous. Notably, the get stripped butt naked and be scrubbed to an inch of your life procedure is pretty much standardized across nuclear, biological, and chemical exposure. It's the quickest and most surefire way to get you as good as you possibly can be. Now, of course, nuclear is a problem and biological is its own problem, but still, get butt naked, get shaved, get scrubbed is just what's going to happen. But oh no, this is anime wearing a meat suit, and anime has cute guys with crazy hairdos. Can't shave him. Although speaking of anime and all that baggage, you gotta love movies made in Japan, honestly. First off, you have that beautifully non-emotional, anti-emotional, craggy captain who can carry himself with such bearing and such demeanor and such calm. It's quite impressive, honestly. And then you have these airsoft abominations that, I mean, Japan just cranks out like they're candy. It's kind of one of the biggest exports when you get right down to it, I suppose. This looks like it used to be a G36, maybe? Or some kind of knockoff XM8? It's hard to tell. Either way, there are all kinds of companies in Japan that exist to crank out these sci-fi looking airsoft guns for airsoft battles. And they always end up as props in their movies, which is always fun because you always get something that looks interesting, at least. Not your, like, rank and file, everyone's seen it before, M whatever, M16, M14, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's all been done before. Make it interesting. Make it fun. Don't pull a Battlestar Galactica and throw a freaking Beretta carbine into action. Come on now. Um, I'm sorry. I, I do apologize. That noise you just heard was a significant chunk of my processor banks spontaneously committing suicide over what they just saw. As far as I can tell, this show, movie, series, whatever, revolves around resurfacing the battleship Yamato that served during World War II for the Empire of Japan and using it as a spaceship, which, yes, is already a bizarre enough idea, but let's back up for just a second. The Yamato was the lead ship of her class, and... I mean, she didn't show up to the party, you know, unequipped. In 1945, she mounted three triple turrets of 46 centimeter guns, two triple turrets of 15.5 centimeter guns, 12 twin 12.7 centimeter guns, and then a whole butt ton of anti aircraft and so on and so forth. At the waterline, her armor belt was 410 millimeters thick. Her deck was between 200 and 226 millimeters thick, and her turrets were 650 millimeters thick for armor, on the face at least. Now, to back up, those 46 centimeter guns are 18.1 inches. Yes, those are bigger, in fact, than the, the, the ubiquitous 16-inch guns of your United States Navy battleships. She was 263 meters long. That's nearly 900 feet. She had a beam of 39 meters or 127 feet and a draft of 11 meters or 36 feet. She was powered by 12 boilers, 
She had four shafts, each of which had their own steam turbine and could somehow maintain a top speed of 27 knots, which is roughly approximate to 31 miles an hour or 50 kilometers an hour. And at 16 knots, she could travel 7,000 nautical miles, 13,000 kilometers or 8,000 miles, statute miles, surface miles, however you want to phrase it. This bitch had 3,233 individuals on board as her crew. God damn. All in all, the Yamato was kind of a pain in the ass for your United States Navy and military in general. She was a goddamn beast. But, as is often the case for battleships that don't sail under the banner of your United States nation-state, uh, she came to a bad end. Her final tasking, oddly enough, from the Empire of Japan, was to sail to the island of Iwo Jima, literally deliberately beach herself, and be a permanent bunker installation in the defense of that island. Obviously, she didn't make it. It took at least direct hits from 11 torpedoes and 6 bombs to finally sink this absolute beast of a battleship in somewhere around 340 meters or 1,100 feet of water, and in two separate pieces, she actually snapped apart somewhere in the process. The TLDR of that entire process is that she was steaming towards Iwo Jima without escorts and got absolutely bum-rushed by a massive squadron of U.S. Navy aircraft, and predictable things happened when battleships were found out in the middle of the ocean without escorts and aircraft found them. Whoopsies. But all that said, this damn near prehistoric battleship, now in two pieces, weighed 65,000 tons empty and nearly 72,000 tons full. 72,000 tons. That is 72 million kilograms or 158 million pounds. Think about that for a second. That, that's a lot of mass. And you're telling me that not only did these humies who are on the brink of extinction by way of being shelled from Mars, not only did they raise the Yamato from whatever trench she was in, because apparently the oceans had been boiled off, not only did they raise her, they put the two pieces back together somehow, and they're supporting that 72,000 ton weight, which almost certainly only got heavier by the introduction of, you know, star drives and shock cannons and space torpedo launchers and airlocks and life support systems and all the rest of that nonsense. She's only heavier than she used to be. You're telling me they are supporting that 72 plus 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 thousand ton mass with those cute little spindly yellow arms. Ain't no fucking way in goddamn hell. Even if the actual arms were strong enough, the towers holding up the arms are literally just scaffolding for the frickin' ladders up to the arms. Why do the arms need ladders? And, yeah, that would all just shear off, collapse, those two old guys would be smooshed, and that'd be the end of the movie. Short movie, I guess. Now, moving on with the absolute ridiculousness of this movie, apparently that green blinking capsule that our apparent hero picked up is a message capsule from the planet of Iskandar in the Magellanic Cloud. Yeah, that's a whole separate galaxy. Lord knows how it got to Earth. But apparently the large story is that the people of Iskandar are willing to give Earth technology to eliminate radiation. It's all good and well, I guess. I mean, considering that Earth is, you know, covered in radiation at this point. But, I mean, are we talking about free radiation? Are we talking about radioactive particles? I mean, like I said previously, that guy wandering around the, the cruiser or destroyer or whatever while he was all contaminated and stuff, he did rolled around in radioactive dust for at least a few minutes and was shedding that crap all over the ship. 
So what kind of radiation does it remove and does it really matter? I mean, you humies need something to latch on to to keep yourselves around and alive and find an excuse to keep on living at this point. Also, notably, despite this being a Japanese movie recorded originally in the Japanese audio language, a lot of the signage in the background is written in what appears to be English. Weird choice. Now, speaking of radiation, there are a few things worthy of note in this particular scene. Of course, our hero who is exposed to massive amounts of radiation and did that whole rolling around of the radioactive dust nonsense is still, of course, around. We'll come back to that. Most interestingly, the headsets worn by the Marines, guards, army personnel, hard to say, look really like the headsets worn by the troopers from the Aliens movie, which is an interesting callback, perhaps, along with the tabby-ish feline sitting on the desk. I mean, I am a huge fan of ships, cats, my own personal self. I mean, cats are pretty awesome organisms, unlike, say, humies. But, uh... It's an interesting thing that they went ahead and tossed a red tabby along with alien-esque technology into the environment. Now, the, the doc here, sitting, taking off her glasses quickly, is the one who treated our hero when he came back from Earth all radioactive and glow in the darky, and somehow he survived, and she's having to come to terms with that. And again, this is one of those times where the movie gets it right, which makes it so much worse that they get so many other things wrong. Because the first thing she does is check his eyes, and then she has him open wide, and she checks his throat. And then she checks the front of his throat, and then she checks the base of his neck. Okay, let's talk about why! Basically, your human bodies are weak and frail and fragile and particularly susceptible to radiological exposure and really cranky when they get heavy metals inside of them. So... First, she was checking his eyes because one of the first things to go when you get significantly irradiated are all the mucous membranes and soft, wet, squishy parts of your body, which granted is a lot of your body, but the exterior ones are the easiest ones to check, of course. So you check around the eyes. You check the eyes themselves. You're looking for lesions, deterioration, weird spots. Then, of course, you move into looking on the inside of your throat because, of course, he was breathing in those radiological heavy metals, dust, debris, who knows what else. And even if it wasn't radioactive, heavy metal is not good for your mucous membranes. It causes, again, lesions, obvious swelling, bleeding, all kinds of obvious symptoms that can obviously be seen by obvious eyesight. It's not that hard to determine that someone's breathed in a whole lot of metal dust they shouldn't have or have been exposed to a lot of radiation they should not have. Then she moved on to checking his thyroid. This little gland wraps itself around your humeosophagus or something and is really, really essential to the continuing operation of your body on a variety of different levels that we're not just not going to get into at this point. The real reason it's relevant is something called iodine-131. Now, as anyone who has taken chemistry might know, any element name with a number after it is probably an isotope, and you would be correct in this case. Iodine-131 is a radioactive isotope of iodine. It is a byproduct specifically of fission nuclear events, which your Humi United States scientists discovered courtesy of all of the open-air atomic testing they did way back when. Turned out to be very healthy for everyone who was downwind of it. Not at all, actually. Whole separate conversation. But anyways, for whatever reason, your thyroid absolutely loves it some iodine-131. It's really strange. This is why they recommend you take iodine, normal iodine capsules, if you're going to be exposed to certain kinds of radiation and radiological materials or a radioactive burst. Because if you saturate your thyroid with normal, natural, standard iodine, it will not take up the radioactive isotope. Ironically, iodine-131 is also used to treat thyroid cancer. Because, again, the thyroid loves it some 131, so it takes it up, kills off the cancer, and you go back to normal. Treating your squishy bodies is really complicated and just bizarre. 
And finally, she checks his lymph nodes, because if you have been exposed to significant quantities of radiation, your lymph nodes basically get overwhelmed trying to get all of that waste material out of your body. And by waste material, I mean your cells literally dissolving and falling apart. Yeah, radiation exposure is not terribly fun for squishies. So she just did like a brute force 30 second, like, how much radiation have you received? Check and came up empty. That little green beacon thingy was pretty awesome, wasn't it? Wait, 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 wait a second. So, yeah, okay, the scrapper dude who was picking up trash on the surface of the planet earlier and got himself exposed to radiation, picking up green blinking doohickey, and then somehow clean of radiation, blah, 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 so on and so forth, used to be a fighter pilot of some sort. And they just randomly toss a squadron at him when he decides to re-enlist again? What? <laughs> that is not how basically any military would work. I mean, yeah, sure, maybe he was a squadron leader back when he was in however many years ago, but he's out of practice, he does not know his unit, and he doesn't know who he's leading. Even more so than commanding a ship, commanding a squadron requires a significant, you know, uh, attachment to your people. Those silly little emotions you squishies have factor in significantly in how to lead and how to uh, engage in combat with these people, quote unquote, covering your six. And he ain't got none of that. In fact, I mean, like three scenes ago, he was trying to cold cock the captain of the ship he's on right now. They stopped him, of course, but I mean, that's a great way to start a relationship with your fellow co-workers and people who you will be fighting a war with, right? And apparently the Gamalas have something in addition to just asteroids to yeet at Earth. They have what appears to be a very large, possibly semi-organic missile intended to knock out the Yamato before it can even launch. Kind of cool, honestly. I mean, it kind of like opens up and stuff. Of course, there's a question as to why it would be opening up right before it entered an atmosphere. It seems like this kind of device would want to move as quickly as Gamalassian possible in order to hit the Yamato before it could mount any effective defense. Deploying arrow brakes would kind of defeat that purpose. I do appreciate, though, how the uh, wave engines that appear to propel the Yamato bear a striking resemblance to a lot of various designs y'all humies have had regarding fusion plants and particle colliders and stuff like that. I guess artists have to get inspiration somewhere, right? Of course, on the flip side, I cannot even begin to describe how having an actual window into a live fusion reactor is probably not a good idea for the humies behind the window, but whatever. And now we get to the grand reveal scene where the Yamato forcefully rises from the surface of the shattered earth. Through dirt. Why was it buried? How are they working on it? I mean, yes, you could see the bottom side of the hole in that cavern that was way too big and the ship was being held up by those little yellow things that were way too small. But why are the turrets buried? Why is the rest of the ship Buried. I mean, yes, I imagine they're trying to hide it from the Gamalus or something, but you do what the frickin' Stargate program did with the Prometheus. Yeah, the, the doors on the hangar are the hiding method, not literally burying the ship in literal dirt. How is it digging itself out right now? I mean, I... Yes, like we just talked about not too long ago, the Yamato is very heavy, and the drives necessary to propel it must be very strong as a consequence. That dirt ain't light either. And I, I don't know about you Humies all the time, but I do know that my particular Waldos have a significant difficulty working on anything when it is literally buried in dirt. Choices were apparently made. And speaking of choices, of course, yes, this particular interstellar vessel does look like a nautical navy warship because apparently it's built on the hull of the old Yamato. So at least that makes a certain degree of sense. As we've discussed previously, it seems like your submarines would be a great basis for a space battleship of some sort. And I suppose taking an old battleship and doing the same thing again would also make sense given the thickness of their freaking hulls. Now, how they put the two pieces of this one together, I don't know. They did at least retain the configuration of the conning tower, the stacks, and the, I assume, rangefinder behind the stacks. I have no idea what that obnoxious assembly is. But of course, once again, this is where everything falls apart. 
Because guess where the bridge is? You know, the place you steer the ship from, the place you fight the ship from. Go ahead and guess. If you guessed that the bridge was buried somewhere in that massive hulk of armored hull, you would, of course, be wrong. If you guessed the bridge was the first little angly bit at the bottom of that conning tower, you'd also be wrong. If you guessed the bridge was the second angly bit with the obvious windows, the big angly bit, you'd also be wrong. No, they actually put the primary bridge at the very nearly top of the conning tower. This is a spaceship. This is a spaceship that's going to be engaging targets at spaceship distances. First off, windows are not very helpful. And second off, why is it dangling out there at the end of a stock? I mean, this situation isn't quite technically as bad as Admiral Radice's uh, MC-75 Mon Calamari cruiser from Rogue One, where he was literally, like, doodling around underneath his ship, almost as far away from his ship as his ship is long. But the Moncals at least have, you know, shields. If the Humies in the Battleship Yamato story have shields, they suck. So why are you putting your bridge out there? Out in the middle of nowhere? If nothing else, it takes forever to get to. And more importantly, it's going to get shot off. You already know the weapons you are going up against can literally core your ships. So, I mean, I, I guess you can approach it from the nihilistic, fatalistic perspective of we're all going to die anyway, so we might as well have a good view. Uh -huh. And of course, because this is a ridiculous anime movie parading around in a Humi flesh suit, the solution to the incoming Gallimus missile, even after you supposedly scrambled your fighters, and despite there being main cannons on the deck and hopefully underside of the Yamato, is of course to try out the wave cannon that everyone knows the Yamato for, for the first time ever. They haven't even run, like, simulations. They haven't test-fired it. They don't even know how the darn thing works, aside from whatever plans the aliens gave them on how to make it. So you have an incoming missile. You have an unproven weapon system. You have a guy who barely understands what the hell he's doing. And yes, this is obviously the solution for taking out that incoming missile. I mean, I guess, once again, you can approach it from the standpoint of if the wave cannon blows up the ship, well, the missile is going to blow up the ship anyway, so no big change, right? Huh? What's worse could happen? Oh, no. The Yamato doesn't have turrets on its ventral side. Because it's a spaceship. Why would it need turrets on its ventral side? I mean, it's not like space combat is three-dimensional or anything. Instead, what it has is more windows. Why are there windows down there? I mean, seriously, is that like the secondary bridge where the first one gets blown off? I, I guess that makes a certain degree of sense. Do they have like a little express elevator that everyone can pile into and just zips them down to the secondary bridge and off we go again? What the hell? Yeah, but... Uh, what? Hold on. You're telling me that the wave motion cannon, the cannon that is literally built into the keel of the Yamato, where you have to literally point the ship at the thing you want to shoot, because it's not turret mounted, it is spinally mounted into the ship. The wave motion cannon's control system is a vaguely humanoid pistol looking contraption built into the conning station? You steer the ship and thereby aim the wave motion cannon by way of a fake gun. And then you pull the trigger to fire the cannon. I, I mean, I guess it's technically a better interface than the one that was used in uh, Babylon 5 spinoff uh, Legend of the Rangers, where someone's like floating around in this zero G space and they punch and kick to direct where their ship is firing. But this is pretty fucking ridiculous. Oh, and since your bridge does in fact have windows, and since the wave motion cannon is apparently quite energetic, your bridge crew has to put on, like, laser goggles in order to prevent from blinding themselves. Why aren't your windows polarized? Why don't they, like, automatically darken when the gun fires? That'd be kind of cool, right? But no, we have to take the time to put on the silly goggles. Well, uh, although on the other hand, to give the movie some degree of credit, they did at least consider the, uh, you know, ecological impact of discharging this kind of weapon inside of the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, this is 
a spaceship. The weapon was probably mostly designed to be used in space, but releasing that massive quantity of energy in an atmosphere, of course, has side effects, like that shockwave that is spreading out rapidly from where the Yamato is hovering. Didn't there used to be like a civilization right next to the Yamato, like a whole underground city and stuff? Did they just blow that up? Hmm, no. Didn't blow it up, but not having a good time in the underground bunker anyways. But the good news is everyone appears to have survived, the ship appears to be intact, and yeah, they just told the Gamalus exactly what kind of technology they now have available to them. Up until now, it seemed like the Gamalus were just content lobbing rocks at Earth and, and taking the long view and waiting out the eventual extinction event that the humans were going through in slow motion. I imagine now dropping that kind of weapon onto the playing field changes a lot of people's priorities. Choices were made. Again, why didn't we use the main battery to shoot down the missile? Seems a bit excessive to go, like, super laser on an incoming missile. Granted, it seemed to be a pretty large missile, although honestly they never gave us a, uh, something to scale it against. So it could have been a foot long, it could have been a mile long, it's not really clear. And again, to give credit where credit is due, I do have to appreciate that the anchors on the Yamato are not actually anchors. They appear to be rocket-propelled grappling hooks. That actually makes sense. One of the few things it does. Of course, speaking of the stacks, that is to say the smoke stacks that the original Yamato had, I have no idea why they retain that particular feature on the space-going Yamato, given that she is, as you can clearly see, rocket-propelled of some sort or another. I'm also vaguely amused that her entire stern turned into one massive engine, and then they put the two little ones underneath. I mean, given that she originally had four screws, you'd think they would have done some sort of symmetry there instead, but I guess not. And speaking of things that should have been done and were not, they unfortunately retained one of the worst design features of most nautical battleships during the World War II era on your planet, for reasons that make absolutely no sense given the existence of the wave motion gun. The gun that you have to point the entire ship at the target to fire. Note that at least one of the main battery turrets, and possibly both of the forward-firing ones, is obstructed by that ridiculous prow it has. So if you were to line up the wave motion cannon on a given target, you would then block your battery guns from firing at the same target. Now, granted, the wave motion cannon does seem to have a complete obliteration effect, regardless of what you point it at. But still, why is the prow there? That that structure is there as a, a, a wave deflection system for these ships. They were so long and so heavy that if they steamed into the waves, which is the correct way of handling waves... If the waves were big enough, they would auger into the, the valley of the waves and have to kind of pull themselves back out again. That structure on the prow was meant to deflect the water away from the batteries behind it, as well as the deck and everything else. Well, there aren't really any water waves in space. You don't need that. It's purely stylistic. And right now, it's getting in the way of your guns. I do at least appreciate that the cruise quarters are not terribly dissimilar from what your modern Navy use these days. In fact, these are actually quite comfortable quarters. These may be the pilots judging by their jackets, although I can't decide if that's a consistent design theme or not. Regardless, uh, most navies run three or possibly even four racks in the space where they just have the two here. And a lot of the navies don't have the ladders there. You just have to climb on the bed beneath yours to get to yours. Beyond that, the compartments and the latching and the little things tacked up all over the place, it actually looks pretty right. They did a good job capturing the feel. Speaking of things they got in the direction of right, it appears that the warp drive used by the Yamato is not the same kind of warp drive that Star Trek uses. Instead, it appears, judging by these diagrams, to be a uh, artificial wormhole generation system where they literally warp space and connect two points and drive through the connection point. Naturally, this appears to have some sort of side effect on these squishies on board, probably something to do with the simple fact that biologics don't like having their space warped. Even uh, Guardians of the Galaxy touched on that. And here we see, for some reason, that the battleship, the space battleship Yamato, kept the original Yamato's launch catapults. Not really sure why. The catapults on the aquatic Yamato were used to launch seaplanes for observation for long-range purposes, basically, and then they were recovered by way of davits or cranes built onto the battleship. 
This one does have a fighter complement on board, but they appear to be housed in an internal hangar. And those catapults do not appear to be configured like launch tubes or anything like that. So I have no idea why they're there. It's worth pointing out, though, that it does only have the one main battery on the stern with another smaller battery right above it. And then a whole broadside complement of five inch equivalent guns, as well as some interesting hatches kind of like right at the where the water line would be if this thing were a sh an actual seagoing ship. Those hatches could be the launch tubes for the fighters it carries. It could be something else. I guess we'll find out. And in news that probably should not have surprised anyone, not only did the Gamelas notice that the Yamato did a warp jump, they appear to have warp adjacent drives themselves and have decided to catch up and take care of this problem that poses a single biggest threat to their invasion force. Now, once again, I do appreciate their ship designs. One of them is clearly uh, Terran avian in style. And the other one is almost simian, maybe? I don't know. Kind of like a, a overgrown ape of some sort crawling forward. I don't know. Maybe I'm stretching a whole lot on that. Either way, they're interesting ship designs. Anyways, the good news is we finally figure out why humans were mounting fighters to begin with. It does appear that the Gamelas do actually have fighters of their own, and they carry them in a particularly odd spot on that avian-style ship, but eh, choices. And speaking of choices, of course the wave energy gun uses the same energy as the warp drive. Therefore, you cannot fire it immediately after warping. Because you would never, absolutely never use the warp drive to get yourself into a combat situation or out of a combat situation or into an ambush. Totally not. Never happen. Nope. Oh, wait. And even more choices, it does appear that the Yamato does have a catapult system for its fighters. For some reason, it's ceiling mounted. And for some reason, the space that the catapult is in is big enough to hold like five or six of these fighters stacked up on top of each other. So are you planning on like catapulting a fighter over a fighter? Why, why would you make the flight deck not where the catapult is? And why would you leave that much space unless you were planning on doing carrier deck operations underneath the catapult while the catapult was firing? That seems like a safe environment. Now, the interesting thing about the fighters in the Yamato movie is that they seem to cheat around the edges when it comes to inertia. Of course, again, since this is an anime dressed up in a meat bag suit, the fighters bank and curve exactly like you expect them to in an atmosphere. However, in this particular case, the fighter is actually traveling away from the direction it's shooting while it's shooting in a different direction. So it's kind of doing a flat spin almost if it were in the atmosphere, but it built up enough speed and then kicked itself around and started burning into the other direction. But at this time, it was still moving in the original direction. So I guess Humis have inertial dampeners, but they're not perfect. I don't know what other explanation there would be aside from it looks cool. Which, let's be honest, this is basically an anime movie, which, so it looks cool, is pretty much the driving force. Now, it is also worth noting that the Gamelus use a similar missile structure for even their anti-fighter missiles. We still have no idea how big that anti-cap ship thing they launched at the Yamato was, but these missiles here are chasing a Humi fighter, and they're quite small. They were launched from the Gamelus fighters themselves, and they use a similar kind of like pedal structure, although these are spin-stabilized as opposed to the, their larger cousin just kind of cruising in slowly. And here we have yet another instance of they got so close to getting it right and then somehow missed somewhere along the way. Consider the cockpit, specifically the area around it. That little triangle logo directly beneath the pilot and his window is actually a warning that there's an ejection seat inside of that cockpit. Also, that cockpit is probably pyrotechnically discharged when the ejection seat is fired. Notably, those yellow handles directly above the pilot's head is one way that uh, you can activate some ejection seats. It depends on what kind of ejection seat, what kind of aircraft, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Some of them have levers between your legs. Some of them have levers uh, on either side of the seat. Some of them you reach over your head and grab. And when you grab, you actually pull down this hood over your face that's supposed to protect you as you get launched out. Now, they're wearing helmets and stuff, so I have no idea if they have to do that or not. And I doubt they're actually, like, blasting through the glass like some old uh, ejection seats used to do. I am quite certain that ca cockpit canopy is, is forcibly removed from the aircraft. Which leads me to the rescue arrows. There's one just on that kind of A-pillar line of the cockpit. 
And then one just behind the cockpit, although the one behind the cockpit doesn't expressly say rescue. This is where things get a little weird. Technically, that rescue arrow at the front should be pointing at a panel that is removable. I can't tell from the graphics if that panel is designed to be removable or not, the one that it's actually pointing at. And inside of that panel are the means to either manually blow the cockpit or disarm the cockpit blowing system. Again, it depends on the uh, specific aircraft as to which was the case. Basically, this is how you get a pilot out quickly in case of an emergency. In case, say, the aircraft, or in this case, space fighter, catches fire on the flight deck and you have to get the pilot out quickly, you either want to blow the cockpit off of him or disarm the system so that when you break into the cockpit, it doesn't blow off into you. Now, it could be that the one behind the cockpit is the disarm system and the one next to the cockpit is the launch it anyway system. But either way, the panels that cover those mechanisms should be a lot more obvious than what they included in this particular graphic. Either way, here you can clearly see the Wing Commander influences on the design of these fighters. And yes, I am aware that Wing Commander may have been influenced by anime. I honestly have no idea about the lineage either direction. But that looks a lot like a rapier to me. It's just me, maybe. Also, I have no idea why the running lights on the prow of the fighters are both green. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Maybe it's a visual IFF signal, although, I mean, the Gamblers seem to feature green lights all over their ships as well. So that's not terribly helpful. But the left one's supposed to be red and the right one's supposed to be green. Having them both being green is pretty useless, and not having them out on the tips of the wings is also pretty useless. So, whatever. Now, the really interesting thing is that the fighters were initially sent out there to disable the Gamelus uh, warp drive so that they couldn't pursue the Yamato on her next warp jump. All good and well. From the first fight at the opening scene of this movie, we were pretty sure that the fighters weren't actually making a significant dent in the uh, Gamelus ship's capital ship's armor. So I'm not really sure what the plan there was. As it turns out, what actually happened is that the fighters flew by one of the ships and tagged some locations for the main battery on the Yamato to take a shot at. So all nine cannons took a shot at this particular ship's engine structure, I assume, given that was the mission intent. And they seem to have lost a massive amount of containment on a massive amount of energy. I mean, I guess... Technically, destroying the whole ship will also technically destroy the warp drive, notably when this energy finally expands far enough that it collapses in on itself and then super explodes, it takes out all the rest of the ships too. I mean, all the warp drives were destroyed, mission complete. Ah, and now we see where the launch catapults kick you out. Apparently there is a hatch on the ventral side of the Yamato where the fighters launch and probably it can be recovered from. Now, I am terrified to think that the ceiling-mounted catapult is so they can launch and recover simultaneously as long as you keep in mind your relative heights. Um, that would be an exciting operation. Also, this would lead me to believe that the ventral tower coming out of the bottom of the uh, Yamato might be their flight control deck. Possibly. Hard to say. Either way, it's always funny in these anime shows when the hero character, of course, flies an entirely different vehicle than everyone else. Because we have to make sure that the hero is special. As if the hairstyle wasn't enough of a giveaway. I suppose the good news is that the Yamato has absolutely no problems using its secondary and tertiary and quaternary guns against smaller targets, such as the fighters that are closing in on it rapidly at this point. Unlike its cousin uh, capital ships that decided to just not shoot anything except that one barrage and then they gave up. Um, it's... Worth noting, though, that these must be energy weapons and they must have degradation over distance. Otherwise, you'd just use them on everything. If you're using a mass driver style weapon out in space, it'll keep going until it hits something or encounters enough interstellar gas to actually make a significant enough difference on its speed, which is going to take a while. Now, ironically, one of the fighters that they were engaging with those sub guns got through that barrage of energy bursts and managed to ram itself into the side of the Yamato, causing basically superficial damage but the bridge crew was apparently absolutely horrified that the little fighter went and rammed itself into the ship well that's all kinds of ironic given the uh, current context you know and speaking of you know japanese things of course since this is a japanese anime movie we can't just have normal fighters oh no we have to have transforming fighters because that's apparently the shtick and not only transforming fighters, but transforming fighters that have these weird little, like, grappler arms where landing gear should be. 
I don't really get the point of that. Does it like walk around on the flight deck in order to get itself into position? And also, why does it have the bendy cockpit at all? Why would you go to the effort of making the bendy cockpit and the, the ducted thrusters at the stern and all the rest of this? Maybe they'll show us later. Maybe they just thought it was cool. Who knows at this point? The funny thing is, here we are on a space battleship already in combat. One, two times already, if you count them shooting down the missile as actual combat. A spaceship in space, in combat, and they are getting ready to evade the next wave of gamma-less fighters who are going on suicide runs, and they have to send over this announcement over the 1MC to prepare for G-Force. Like, no shit. I mean, who could have seen that coming? And why are these derps tying down the equipment now? Why wasn't it tied down for launch? Why wasn't everything secured for launch? Why wasn't everything secured for combat? This is what you do. Unless you are actively, deliberately, intentionally using it at that exact moment, you tie that fucker down. This isn't even a spaceship problem where you could actually like lose gravity and things start floating away. This is an actual nautical navy thing because, again, waves. You don't want this tractor or whatever the hell it is rolling around and squishing people. You tie it the fuck down. But I suppose already having everyone strapped in the G couches and having everything already strapped down does not make for an exciting movie when the missiles start coming in. <sighs> the things you people do to make suspense. And then, of fucking course, because we haven't maxed out the ridiculousness of this movie yet, the way we evade from these incoming fighter missile suicide bomb, whatever you want to call them, doohickeys, I'm sure there's a term for it, is to roll the ship. So the ship isn't like entirely cylindrical. I assume the cow is a sphere. No, it's, I mean, it, it has like dimensions aside from round and long. <laughs> but still, if you just rotate it around its long axis, and it's a long axis, it won't make a difference. You're still going to be shipping the way. Would have been easier just to drop the whole ship or lift the whole ship either way and get it out of the path of the, the fighters. But just rolling it doesn't remove it from the path. It'd be like a tank getting shot at and going, hey, I'm just going to like rotate in place. That'll, that'll make a miss, right? You're still there, for heaven's sake. And speaking of absolute ridiculousness, you really have to appreciate how this is the last space warship for the human race. It's one of the last warships on the planet, really, give or take whatever kind of space or nautical nonsense you want to employ. This is the last hope of humanity. This is the only way you're ever going to reclaim your place in the solar system. It is the biggest undertaking that humanity has ever undertook. And they installed a brig. They legit installed a no-joke brig. They took the time to do that. Gotta love you humies and your rules. I mean, yeah, the, the guy in the brig, the hero, of course, because he's a bad boy, did break the rules and did put the ship in danger, and the CO actually responded fairly reasonably. But still, to confine him to quarters, why did he go to the effort of actually building a legit brig? I'd also like to take a moment and point out how, while anime did inspire a great deal of science fiction tangents of its own, let's deconstruct the obvious inspiration this particular scene pulls from. On the left, we have the older, wizened, highly skilled, somewhat congenial, amusing engineer who's been around forever, served with everyone, and knows everything. He can probably make a warp drive out of chewing gum and a paperclip. In the middle, we have the ship's doctor, who frequently has no idea what's going on because she's just a doctor. Also, she's quite frequently a few bottles into the day, depending on the kind of day it is. And finally, we have the, again, bad boy, who frequently finds himself in a world of trouble just because he doesn't like the rules and likes doing things his way. Does that trio, say, remind you of anyone in particular? I mean, just saying. Moving back to the technical side of things, it appears that Humies do possess some sort of FTL communication system. The Yamato stops somewhere in the Neptune-Uranus-Pluto range of the solar system before her final jump out 
of the galaxy to the Magellanic Cloud, as we discussed previously, and allows their crew a minute apiece to talk to their families back at home. Except it's all real-time communication. Yeah. On average, Pluto is about 263 light minutes from Earth, and that means any communication system that travels at the speed of light, say radio, will take approximately 263 minutes to get from the transmitter to the receiver, and then another 263 minutes to go back. So real-time comms implies some significant technology that they don't really have any means to have otherwise. I mean, apparently they never sent their ships a whole lot farther than Mars, and that lags only about 10 to 15 minutes, depending. But it's too hard to talk about lag in these kinds of movies, and it's too hard to do, like, message in the bottle, the crew records it all, sends it all off, and then leaves kind of thing. We have to have maximal emotional impact with the people talking to their families. And speaking of maximal emotional impact, we of course cannot have a science fiction movie without a vaguely sapient possible artificial intelligence of some sort. That's his detector that was warning him about the 14 sieverts that would have killed him earlier in the movie. Apparently it has a bit of an attitude. And speaking of things with attitudes, apparently during one of the jumps the Yamato was making to the large Magellanic Cloud, they came across a apparently dysfunctional gamelous fighter it was turned off floating in space randomly out in the middle of nowhere and humans being humans guess what they did they brought it on board why would you do that why um it's a fighter it has at least one pilot probably it has weapons that's for sure it certainly has a power plant if it decided to go pop inside of your hangar that would be bad and, of course, it does turn out that the Gamelus fighter does, in fact, have a pilot who somehow rides around on the outside of the ship and somewhat takes it personally when they try to stab said ship to get a culture sample, tissue sample, whatever, and shanks one of the humans before scrambling onto the ceiling and running off. Yeah, you totally wanted that on your ship, didn't you? As a brief aside from the little alien now scrubbing on the deck after he got his ass shot... I have to wonder if this movie used one of your uh, aquatic uh, four-wheeled conveyance transport vehicles for the set, a, a ferry that resembles like the entrance and exit of a, a ferry loading ramp or door of some sort, or maybe they used a roll-on, roll-off carrier. Either way, there aren't enough uh, tie-down uh, pad eyes on the deck to for this to be a military vessel those pad eyes those the the yellow things right in front of them actually aren't pad eyes pad eyes are are, are plush shaped indentations into the deck into which you can slot the tie downs to hold everything down well on military vessels those are all over the decks because you never know where you have to tie something down at this thing doesn't have that which makes me wonder what it is and what it does aside from being a set anyways like i mentioned the alien now on the deck uh, was actually like holding on to the outside of the ship or mounted to the outside of the ship or something. He, he was definitely on the outside of the ship. There was no cockpit. He was just along for the ride. And I'm somewhat surprised that a few rounds from what appear to be standard chemically uh, fired firearms were able to bring him down, given that he was literally exposing himself to the rigors of space and space combat without even so much as an apparent spacesuit. Anyways, uh, speaking of the alien, of course, when they shot it, weird things happened, and the consciousness that was inhabiting its particular body was able to hijack one of the humies on board the Yamato. This is why you don't bring stranger ships onto your ship. You never know what they're carrying. But what I want to call out here specifically is at least our hero was given some training at some point in the past with regards to firearms, specifically your booger hook. Keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire. Now, I mean, you could make an argument that He's pointing his firearm at an enemy combatant, and he should probably be ready to fire. But that enemy combatant is actually one of his friends who's been body jacked by an alien. So it's a little complicated. Thankfully, though, that particular firearm wasn't actually a firearm. It was some sort of stun energy weapon, which left the Humi intact and convinced the consciousness to get the fuck out. Right before that, though, the consciousness disclosed that they weren't actually attacking Earth. They were terraforming it by way of nuclear renovation apparently they have a much more nuclear environment than you humans are accustomed to good for them that makes them a lot more resilient what i really want to call out in this particular scene is the significant difference between 
say, the U.S. Navy and the Navy of almost any other country out there. And that is the bar dispenser in the mess. As far as I can tell, those are various bottles of various flavored ethanol, which almost every other Navy on the planet allows their crew to consume while the ship is underway. On the other hand, the U.S. Navy has the policy that there is strictly no alcohol allowed on board ever, except unless if the ship has been underway for more than 90 days, in which case each sailor is afforded two beers. Yes, the Navy has removed the rum out of the rum sodomy and lash. In fact, they've removed the lash, too. That's awkward. Now, again, as I said, other navies don't have this particular hang-up about alcohol. The only requirement is that you are not allowed to consume any alcohol within a certain time before you are on duty, which only makes sense. I mean, you humies can't tolerate your alcohol while you're driving your four-wheel conveyances on your smooth, paved roads. You're going to be a freaking nightmare on the ocean or in space with a little ethanol inside you, much less in a fighter. Great maker. Can you imagine a drunk human in a fighter? Oy. And oh, hey, remember that analogy I was trying to draw a little while ago with the engineer and the dock and the flyboy outside the brig or whatever the hell? Would you look at that? Yeah, that's just not going to happen. I, yes, aviators do frequently end up being captains of carriers. This makes a certain degree of sense. They understand the whole flight ops side of the thing, and their XO is typically a surface warfare officer who understands the whole fight the ship side of the thing. Works out okay. Putting a fighter pilot in charge of a battleship is about as stupid as putting a battleship captain in a fighter. It makes no sense at all. Very little of it translates whatsoever. And on top of that, this is the bad boy who skipped out on the military for a few years and was just in the brig like today. But oh no, we gotta do our Kobayashi Maru, we gotta demote him back to seamen and then give him captaincy of a ship because that's what heroes do. Now, in fairness, our hero does turn down the offer because in addition to being a bad boy, he's also humble. And then the CO goes ahead and just like makes a shipwide announcement saying he's taking over as captain. So, so much for that. But oh wait, what's that? You have a gamelous ship still in your hangar? You had a gamelous consciousness on your ship? And he literally told you that he was part of a collective consciousness, although he had some sort of individual aspect on top of that? And oh wait, all of a sudden the gamelous know exactly where you are? I am absolutely shocked. Oh my god, is this ship run by idiots? Why didn't they have their sensors pushed out as far as they could go? Why weren't they screaming as fast as they possibly could? Why weren't they setting up some sort of jamming field around the enemy craft still hanging out in their hangar? What is going on on this ship? Thankfully, they finally figured out to do the right thing and yeet the stupid fighter over the side and then blow it up. But at that point, of course, the damage had already been done. And oh, speaking of damage, would you look at that? The bottom, the ventral tower almost got sheared off by a gamma shot. Would you, Yumi, stop putting dangly things on your ships? I know you have an unnatural fascination with them, just like you love you some balls, but come on. And now that the gamelus finally showed up and enough force to actually deploy the damn thing, we finally got to use the wave motion gun in space. Once again, it's blinding to the bridge crew. You can see the poor guy in the back right who walked in unexpectedly and didn't even know the gun was being fired and is now probably blinded for the rest of his life. Why would you make a weapon do this? I mean, granted, it does release a lot of energy, but beyond the weapon doing it, why wouldn't you make the ship's windows, again, polarized for this kind of nonsense or have blast shields, for heaven's sake? I mean, this is a spaceship going into battle and with the bridge dangling out of the end of a stalk. At least give it blast shields. Well, it doesn't seem to really matter because every single gamma shot that hits any human ship absolutely perforates it. So I have no idea why you guys even have a battleship anyways. Give them one big moving target. What the hell the point of that? Might as well break everything up and make lots and lots of small targets and see if they can hit those at range. Or to loop back, at least have a very large on-air sign right outside of the bridge to warn people before they walk in that the big old honking gun just went off and you might want to close your eyes. And when I say big ol' honking gun, I mean a big ol' honking gun. That thing's minimum safe distance seems like it's measured in solar systems. 
Anyways, back to the Yamato actually being a flying piece of crap, apparently. No one noticed that there was a boarding vehicle headed towards the battleship and then suddenly latching on until it was actually latching on. I mean, it's not exactly a small ship. That's their third bridge. That's the, the ventral bridge that's dangling off the underside of the Yamato, and this thing's clamping onto it. How did no one notice that? I mean, maybe the wave motion gun jams sensors in addition to draining obscene amounts of power. So again, seems like a massive design defect. And it's not like it doesn't have sensors. They do seem to have apparently gravitic-based sensors since they keep on calling out gravity wells and stuff. Well, that thing's going to have a gravity well. It's bigger than one of the Gamelus fighters. Why didn't you see it coming? Because story! Or the British crew sucks. Or the Yamato sucks. Take your pick. And of course, the acting captain makes the only decision he realistically can and orders his fighters to basically blow the third bridge off the ship, which makes me think that fighter weapons can even damage the Yamato. This thing really sucks. Anyways, as soon as that flying bomb had latched itself onto the third bridge, the people inside were already dead. They couldn't escape the third bridge because, again, it had already been hit by one of the Gamela shots, and its method of latching on was stabbing its arms through the structure of the third bridge, ventilating the space, and suffocating everyone inside. But, of course, we had to do, again, the emotional vignette of the gentleman that the acting captain ran into in the passageway and how they knew each other and blah, 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 so on and so forth, and how the acting captain now has to deal with killing that guy. Again, probably already dead. Definitely not the captain's fault. Either way, the Gamelus bomb is hysterically contained when it goes off, and even though it's not very far off the Yamato at this point, it doesn't seem to damage it in the slightest bit. Okay, that's not how explosions or energy releases work in space, but sure, we'll, we'll go with that theory. Anyways, the explanation slash rationalization is that the floating bomb was a quote-unquote stealth craft. Might as well write it off as that, right? But, once again, they get it so close to right that I can't help but to laugh. Observe, to the left of the door. Division in charge of cleaning. Every space on board a modern warship has a division that is tasked with cleaning it. This is simply a reality. If it's your actual working space, it's probably your division's job to keep it clean. But common spaces like berthings and stuff like that frequently rotate between different divisions, and it's their responsibility that time to take care of it. And that includes a whole list of things which I can't quite make out on that sheet of paper, but I'm sure it's things like mopping and sweeping and dusting and tidying up and taking out the trash and putting the trash can liner back in and silly stuff like that. But militaries have procedures for all of that, and the checklist must be satisfied. So, every day, the division comes in, runs off the checklist, signs off that they did it, and files that paperwork somewhere. And then the next day, the next division does it, or the same division, depending on if they have like a weekly basis or monthly or whatever. Somebody actually knew that and thought to hang that on the bulkhead. That's just funny. And anyways, yeah, that guy's Kirk. I mean... The first thing he does as acting captain is blow up part of his own ship. And the second thing he does is go and lay a smacker on one of his senior officers. Oh, yeah. 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 That's totally a reasonable series of actions right there. I mean, no, and again, in fairness, blowing the, the boarding charge off the ship was strictly necessary and horrible and necessary. This whole bit. It's for the story. And yeah, basically every regulation and restriction and rule and advice and everything strongly indicates don't do this. And what's even better is he was doing it right before and during one of the warp jumps. You know, one of the things that they still aren't sure they figured out entirely and they're not always really sure where they come out of afterwards and have frequently been jumped after they came out. Yeah, this seems like a totally reasonable thing for a CO to be doing. And speaking of just positively silly things to be doing, I, I love how everyone's just like standing around at Iskandar, which is the destination planet they were going to in the Greater Magellanic Cloud, and just staring at it. I mean, okay, fine. It is, by appearances, an M-type planet, to borrow the Star Trek classification system. It appears to have liquid water on its surface and greenish vegetation, which probably means the atmosphere is likely uh, breathable by you squishy humies. It is a planet, the first planet you've seen outside of your solar system, so that's kind of cool. 
It exists in a very bizarre and complicated galaxy and survived that somehow, which is also kind of cool. But, I mean, let's get some shit done, guys. Don't just stand around. We, we can look at it while we're driving towards it, right? On the other hand, it does appear that the Iskandarians have noticed your uh, approach, so maybe you really should stop staring at the planet and do something useful. But still, speaking of doing things, they are actually trying to get the ship ready to fight, but there's a reason I actually stopped the movie at this particular frame that I'm showing you now, hopefully, assuming I got my act together on this thing. First off, it is intriguing to me that the main battery on the Yamato retained the rangefinders built into the sides of the turrets. You might also know them as telemeters. Basically, through some complicated mechanics and some fairly simple math, you have two optical arrays that feed into a single output and since they are offset by a known distance the amount of adjustments you need to make in order to make the image from both ocular arrays overlap and be the same image will tell you how far away a given object is if you have trouble with that concept i understand a gentleman by the name of pythagoras should be able to help you out Either way, back before the days of radar and all that kind of nonsense, you had big guns that could shoot a long distance, and you had to know how far away a given target would be in order to effectively hit it. Otherwise, you'll overshoot or undershoot or just not hit in general. So you had to have a range-finding system. For a while there, you may do with all kinds of random crap. It was kind of wild. But then you hit upon this telemeter idea, and all of a sudden, guns got a lot more accurate, at least in the range department. Anyways, even with the advent of radar, radar wasn't terribly awesome during World War II, and especially not surface search radar. It was hard to discriminate the noise from the waves from the ships that you were actually trying to target. Shooting a wave doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So, like most battleships, the Yamato mounted one primary rangefinder right on top of her conning tower, and then a secondary rangefinder aft of the stacks, and then each of her main guns had their own rangefinders. Generally speaking, and this varied by ship and actual engagement scenario, the forward rangefinder was the primary one and provided input to all the main guns as to how far a target was away. The secondary rangefinder backed them up and provided support if the first rangefinder got, you know, shot off. Because again, right at the top of the conning tower. And then the guns used their rangefinders just to, like, idiot check the solution and make sure that what information they were getting was accurate. Also, if both rangefinders were shot off, the guns could technically use their own rangefinders, although they were much, much less accurate and precise than the ones in the actual rangefinder towers. Either way, that's what those funny little boxes hanging off the sides of the turret on the Yamato in the original incarnation and the movie incarnation are. They're rangefinders. I don't know why the Yamato needs those. Visual rangefinders at space warfare distances are kind of useless. We're talking about a long, long way away. Now, what's funny is that when uh, the, the original Gamelus missile was headed towards the Yamato while she was still in, I guess, dry dock, being buried in dirt as dry dock? Uh, sure, let's go with that hypothesis. Anyways, while the original Gamelus missile was headed in, it was 1,200 kilometers away, and then all of a sudden it was like 80 kilometers away. Okay, hold on. What happened to all the other numbers in between? I mean, technically, if the rangefinder's ocular prisms were far enough apart, you could do an 80-kilometer solution using a, a telemeter. You wouldn't want to. And this ship clearly has gravitic sensors and radar and all kinds of other sensors, so why did they keep the rangefinders built into the turrets, aside from simply aesthetics? Because yes, the original Yamato, like I said, had the backup rangefinders built into the turrets. So we're going to put turrets on the current Yamato, and we're not going to bother scraping the rangefinders off. Okie dokie. I mean, I don't know in this case if those are rangefinders or not. Maybe those are countermeasure deployment systems, given that there's a number of holes in the little box hanging off the turret. Who knows? Either way, I also appreciate that the main turret, the second main turret behind the first main turret at the front of the ship is moving its guns independently. This is something people frequently forget that battleships can do. Battleships have two ways of adjusting the range of their shells. They can either change the arc by adjusting the, uh, the angle that the gun is pointing up or down. I'm not even sure most of them can depress, honestly. So mostly just up and then changing the powder load behind the shell that is being fired. Once you combine those two, you have a pretty good range of ranges available to you. And while it would be simple and easy to have each main turret engage a single target at a single time, that's not always strictly an option. So yes, each 
barrel of each main turret can actually adjust their angle independently. And they can actually adjust their powder load independently for the original World War II style turrets. Now, in this case, you're not actually tremendously worried about range, although, again, like I said, since these are energy weapons and they seem to degrade over distance, you're at least marginally concerned about range. But regardless, as long as the turret is pointed in the same direction, if you have multiple targets incoming at different angles off the general direction the turret is facing, then you have three different guns that can engage them. Hopefully the guns have a little like lateral wiggle too, so they can maybe engage targets that aren't directly in front of the turret, and that would make it actually pretty dangerous. Finally, I'd like to direct your attention to the, uh, the can with the kind of like bulbous end pointing left in the screen, kind of at the top middle right, uh, above both turrets, kind of up near the, I don't even know what that is now, the battle bridge, the captain's quarters, who knows? On most of your post-World War II battleships and warships in general, that would be called the director radar. This is actually the thing that replaced the rangefinders to figure out what range the actual target is at, what bearing it is at, and how best to totally fuck up its day. Now, on a spaceship in three-dimensional combat, given that the latch mine crawled up underneath the Yamato and bolted itself onto the third bridge weird name but whatever you would think you'd have these directors mounted all over the hole so they could look every possible direction and see whatever they wanted to and target whatever they wanted to but oh no this is space battleship yamato we ascribe to the two-dimensional nautical warfare aesthetic and by the great maker we will not break it on a lighter note, you just have to positively adore how the Yamato is trying to use her main battery in a counter-missile function. Because, you know, these big honking guns that take a second to get on to target and are redonkulously powerful are totally what you want to use to shoot down incoming missiles. Absolutely! It does at least make for a nice glory shot, though, so at least there's that. And almost exactly as I predicted, when the main batteries had to engage a target directly in front of them, they had to elevate! So I guess the ship dipped down slightly. I mean, technically they keep playing this like a two-dimensional nautical battle, but I guess you can dip the nose and shoot forward and shoot at the target in front of you. But still, you shouldn't have to. Oh, hey, wait a second. We know those ship designs. We know that missile design. Oh, wait. Wait a second. What? <laughs> You have got to be kidding me. You're telling me that the Gamalus' solution to the wave motion gun that is mounted in the bow of the mighty Yamato battleship is to pull a Looney Tune stick your finger in it kind of thing? Are you serious right now? I mean, I guess technically, since it's an energy weapon, if that's a bomb that they just shoved up the snoot, and the energy weapon tried to discharge, bad things would probably happen. But why not just make it a bomb to begin with? Why not just blow up the frickin' wave motion gun to start with? Why do the whole, like, little Looney Tunes nonsense? What the hell? And of course, because we're following all the standard sci-fi tropes, the solution to being jumped out the wazoo and having your main gun literally plugged by a figurative finger is to take a blind jump. And, as usual with science fiction, this is a horrible idea. If nothing else, you want to know where you come out, and specifically you want to know that you're not going to come out in, like, a planet or a star or something like that. You want to at least consult navigational charts or spatial charts or something. This show, movie, whatever, seems to have some sort of, like, precognition capability where they're even able to check to see if there are ships where they're about to jump. And given that they're jumping, like, from galaxy to galaxy, I have honestly no idea how the hell that would work. Either way, bad boy gotta do bad boy things, so here we are, coming to the realization that all those missiles would have killed us anyways, so a blind jump if it killed us, well, we're no worse off than we would have been otherwise. I mean, again, horrible calculus, but sometimes you gotta make those calls. And once again, in news that would surprise absolutely no one paying attention, apparently the Gamelists have been busy terraforming Iskandar as well. Given that Iskandar probably poses one of the most significant threat to the Gamelist Empire available, considering their whole, like, 
promise of being able to absorb radiation and ameliorate an environment, apparently the gamelists really appreciate their environment being radiated, so those two would not get along. Now, there's also the argument that the whole Iskandar thing was just a farce and a fake, and the gamelists suckered the uh, battleship Yamato into an untenable situation. I don't even know if the movie's going to get to that kind of like subterfuge, because it really seems like they're losing the bubble at this point. Although, to be fair, apparently the movie's going to address it right after I said that. So, okay, fine, fair enough. Anyways, apparently crazy acting Captain Bad Boy is going to go down to the planet that they came to regardless and see what's going on regardless because he believes that the message is genuine and the gamblers are just trying to prevent him from getting there. I guess we'll find out. I would just like to congratulate the uh, prop or set department, depending on how you want to look at it, for setting up monitors on a science station that block each other. Totally makes sense. I mean, yeah, when, when I'm looking at like graph readouts and stuff, I absolutely want the one on the far left blocked off so I can't see it. Nothing useful will be there regardless. And of course, of course, of course, because we're still talking about a science fiction show that is basically an anime movie dressed up in a meat suit. The captain, of course, the acting captain, I suppose. I, I guess they do have a spare captain at the moment. Regardless, the acting captain, of course, is going to lead the attack on the defense installations that are either protecting wherever they're supposed to be going or trying to keep them from going there regardless. And he's going to be doing it dead stick because apparently his special fighter, which predates a Gamelus attack and has never been made sense for reasons, has stealth capabilities, but those stealth capabilities go out the airlock as soon as he turns on his drives, which doesn't seem very stealthy to me. So he's going to go from the battleship Yamato, ostensibly in orbit, and dead stick his way into an engagement with flying, somewhat stationary, aerial defense turret system thingies. Oh yeah, this makes perfect sense and man to take a brief divergence i have to kind of uh i guess appreciate the brazenness of the uh the framing of the last sailing of the battleship yamato on your oceans on your planet set sail to bring a ray of hope into a time of utter despair yeah imperial japan maybe you shouldn't have picked a fight with someone who is better at fighting than you I mean, let's be honest here. Y'all threw the first punch, and then it turned out you weren't quite as good at fighting as you thought you were. And yes, the Yamato was supposed to be a ray of hope in the most sad, unfortunate kind of way. Her entire purpose was to go to the island of Okinawa and sink herself, beach herself on the shore of Okinawa, and function as a stationary defense installation. This was known as Operation Tengo. And the whole point was that, well, she had bigger guns than the U.S. battleships, and she was a pretty awesome battleship in her own right, in both meanings of the term awesome. And if you couldn't sink her, she'd just keep shooting until you literally dismantled her by explosions. Honestly, not a bad plan. Hell of a defense system. But that's a really bitter ray of hope, isn't it? And then, of course, she got jumped by Allied aircraft and got sank on the way there and split into two pieces. So, I mean, I don't know if I'd make a historical callback to the Battleship Yamato sailing as a ray of hope, because not only that was that ray of hope kind of um, dysfunctional to start with, it didn't end up so good, did it? Maybe, just as a suggestion, don't fuck around and you won't find out. And speaking of fucking around, I almost feel bad for the poor actor on the right side of the screen right now. I mean, yeah, the guy on the left side is wearing the proper PPE for what he's doing, and that is to say personal protective equipment, but the poor guy on the right isn't. And yeah, no, he's not seeing the whole, like, uh, bright glow of whatever kind of welding cutting tool that might be. I don't know, we use molecular separators here, and it's a pain in the ass to keep up with your primitive technology anyways. But still, lots of sparks, lots of stuff. He's hairy. You want to cover up your squishy bits from all that molten metal that's being shot off. Also, there may be some leak through from the, the line that that guy is cutting of the brightness of that torch. Some of those cutting devices you humies use actually emit significant quantities of UV radiation. You really want a face shield for that, or at least you want to shield your eyes at the very least. Your eyes do not like being exposed to UV radiation significantly higher than what your sun puts out. 
Your squishy gelatinous orbs don't even like being exposed to what your own sun puts out. By the great maker, what kind of design defect is that? And moving on, yes, I know, I know, I know, I should talk about the moving speech that acting Captain Bad Boy just gave and the glorious orchestral music that accompanied it. If I had an emotional circuit in my mainframe, I probably would, but I don't. So here we are, looking at the bridge. This is actually one of the first times we get to see the bridge in a way that shows us what the bridge actually looks like. So starting at the stern, back, you've got the captain's station, which is a remarkably complex station for a captain. Most times, honest to God, captains aren't on the bridge unless things are going horribly, horribly wrong, or they just want to be up there just because, you know, being captain's cool. So the console actually looks kind of like an information overload situation for him, especially since he has controls. Like, that looks like a throttle control to the left of the, the seat back, right in front of the red, white, red, white, red, white, red, white stuff on the left side. One of the unspoken reasons that conning officers and officers of the deck exist on the bridge of a ship is to filter information. There is, frankly, too much information on a warship for one person to comprehend. So, conning officers focus on steering the ship. The navigation team, which is mostly made of petty officers, concentrates on navigating the ship. The helmsman concentrates on actually doing the steering of the ship. The lee helmsman probably concentrates on how fast the ship is going. And the lookouts concentrate on what's going on around the ship. And each one of those humies filters to the next level up. For example, the lee helmsman and the helmsman filter to the conning officer. That's, his, that's the conning officer's only job, is what direction the ship is going and how fast it's going. He's supposed to also keep an eye out, just in general, because everyone on the bridge is supposed to keep an eye out, just for safety purposes, but still. And then, above the conning officer is the officer of the deck. The officer of the deck is supposed to be like the, the, the hinge pin for the bridge. He's supposed to be aware of what all is going on everywhere on the bridge, but he doesn't have to be personally involved in any of it. He was given standing orders for either, like, the entire deployment or for the day. They're standing orders of the day. And said that, okay, we need to stay in this box. Okay, conning officer, stay in this box. Okay, navigation team, we need to stay in this box. Let me know if we don't leave the box. The whole point of the bridge team is you have a limited amount of jobs, sometimes down to just one job. And that's what you focus on. And that's how you don't get information overload. Because yes, you Humies love making connections to all kinds of things all the time, every day, all day long. It's infuriating. You can't focus to save your goddamn lives. But that is why, up until recently, bridges on military ships used to be pretty heavily populated as a room on a military ship. You had a helmsman, you had a lee helmsman, you had a conning officer, you had a bosun mate of the watch, you had a quartermaster of the watch, you had probably a bosun seaman and a quartermaster seaman assisting the bosun mate of the watch and the quartermaster of the watch. You had the officer of the deck, you probably had the port and starboard lookouts being part of the bridge crew because they're typically stationed on the bridge wings, that is to say the, the platforms to the left and right side of the bridge where people can stand and, you know, look out. And on top of all that, you had all the people you were training or your various subordinates were training because every single station on a Navy ship is always training someone to replace them or relieve them on the watch or help them. There's always training going on, if nothing else, because people only spend between two and four years on a given ship. So they have to be able to turn their job over to someone else and they have to know how to turn their job over to someone else. And that's a whole process. But you have a whole lot of people on the bridge. Anyways, I'm getting distracted. Regardless, this bridge is odd. I like the navigational table being kind of in the epicenter of the bridge. That's kind of nice, although it's a navigational table, which by definition is two-dimensional, whereas the space they are occupying is, well, space. It's three-dimensional. Regardless... We seem to have lost track of the whole, like, Helmsman and Lee Helmsman thing, because that center console appears to be capable of controlling both the speed and the direction of the ship in order to point the wave motion cannon in the right direction. 
Also, by the way, have we cleared the wave motion cannon yet? Has, has the weird little finger in the, in the barrel been removed? They haven't specified. We spent all this time giving a rousing motivational speech. I hope someone took the time to get that goddamn bomb-looking thing out of the wave motion cannon. Anyways, I think if I remember the movie right, the, the, the console to the right as we face forward on the ship right now is the primary driving console i'm not really clear what the console on the left does i know the console on the right in the middle is like their radar detection gravitic sensor array display system i have no idea what the middle console on the left does and i likewise have absolutely no idea what the two back consoles do but see all of this just kind of pisses me off <laughs> i'm sorry um why why are the conning controls of the ship like transferable yes okay fine if that console to the right blew up the center console could take over well i mean aside from not having shields it does appear that the yamato is not made out of explodium so that's not a significant concern and anyways if a shot came in through those massive five windows at the bow of the bridge it wouldn't matter which console had control they'd all be dead so why are the consoles changing jobs? For that matter, why are the people changing jobs? Yes, okay, fine. We have to have the hero pull the trigger, literally, on the wave motion cannon in order to make the point that he is, in fact, the hero. But why? The unfortunate reality is that you humies are highly distractible, but very easily coachable. Or to put it in another context, yes, trying to steer a single course for the entire remainder of an entire three-month transit of an ocean is never going to work. Which is why literally no Navy does that. There's, I mean, yes, technically the ship is supposed to be making a straight line from point A to point B, although it's not technically a straight line, depending on what kind of uh, map uh, projection you're using. And we'll talk about um, uh, great circle transit routes at some point later, I feel certain, but that's not the point of this right now. Right now, we're talking about how people focusing on steering focus on steering. And yes, steering isn't just like holding the steering wheel in the center and you keep going in the same direction because for your four wheel conveyances, it's a paved road. The road doesn't move. The road doesn't tilt. There's no significant amount of wind that is pushing you off that road. Whereas in the ocean, you are driving something that is absolutely fucking enormous and is very slow to respond. So you have to almost anticipate what is going on around you. It's a very active situation it's a very engaged situation helmsmen are always fiddling with their little wheels or their big wheels or their touch button oh god the the, the touch screen things are, again are a whole separate conversation as well either way helmsmen are always trying to keep the ship on the course because it's kind of a game for them it's kind of a challenge especially when they're being trained but the point that I'm trying to work around to, and I'm taking way too long to get to, I will freely admit, is that you don't change jobs that much. I mean, yeah, the helmsman and the Lee helmsman do uh, can alternate with each other if they care to, because it's basically the same job. They're basically both controlling the ship. But you're not going to, like, rotate stations around like science fiction seems to do all the goddamn time. If for no better reason, your consoles would not have the appropriate controls or information displaying on them. They don't need to. The backups are somewhere else. That's why, like we talked about during the aft steering episode, aft steering is in the aft of the ship. It's not like right behind the bridge or something. It's physically disjoint from the original steering system. Well, it's the same thing here. Not only do the people behind the consoles, those useless humies, know their job and that's about all they know... Their consoles will only be able to do that job regardless, and you can't just be shifting it around to give the hero time to be hero. And either way, if those console operators can't summarize what they're seeing and what they're doing and pass that information on to the commanding officer in enough of a way that he does not need to have an overload of information there in front of him at his consoles, then they should not be doing their jobs, and you need to find someone else to do their jobs for them. This bridge is basically what happens when you have a pile of incompetent people and that you're the captain is having to keep an eye on all of them. That, that's not a great way to run a warship. 
Kind of says something about the prop designers who set it up, though. Ouch. Anyways, one thing the movie did get right about the personnel on warships is the uh, acting captain hero boy told his Marines that they probably weren't going to come back from this particular mission, to which the Marine said, yeah, that's the point. It's about right, honestly. Marines are indeed a special breed, no matter what country they hail from. And then, of course, because movies, they go and fuck it all up all over again. Apparently that little, like, PDA thing that our hero boy has been carrying around since the beginning of the movie that was warning him about the sieverts all those hours ago. Yeah, apparently it's also kind of like an R2 unit. It may or may not augment the onboard computer system for his super special unique fighter that can do all these crazy things. Well, that's all good and well, but apparently it slots into the underside of the fuselage and does not seem to have any kind of cover over it. Man, I feel bad for that poor little thing. Why couldn't the slot be in the cockpit or something? I mean, come on. And speaking of things that simply do not make sense, apparently this hole in the ground that they're all headed towards to figure out what the hell happened on Iskandar is protected by all these flying anti-air defense installations who simply don't notice this random fighter coming screaming past them. I mean, yes, there was a whole conversation earlier about how as soon as he lights off his engines, everybody and his fucking brother will see him, but... Do these things not have, you know, radar, optical sensors at all? Not someone looking out a window going, hey, that's not one of ours. Can we shoot it now? Come on. I do somewhat appreciate, however, the Yamato pulling an Adama maneuver, though. Apparently on his way in, Hero Boy was tagging all of those air defense installations with targeting information. And his crew literally drove the Yamato down through the atmosphere, taking out all those installations as the rest of the fighters tailed behind the battleship. And then right before he hit, they, of course, jumped. Sadly, apparently atmospheric jumps aren't nearly as catastrophic as atmospheric discharges of the wave motion cannon, and they just disappeared as opposed to doing the full Adama maneuver of, like, destroying everything in proximity just by jumping. Also, notably, the bomb is still attached to the wave motion cannon. Come on, guys, can we, can we get that off already? There's a bomb on your ship. You literally blew a chunk off your ship to get the last bomb off your ship. Can we fix that? Anyways, despite encountering active defenses for the hole in the ground that hides the coordinates that they're supposed to be going to, apparently our heroes did not think that there might be fighters in the hole in the ground, the cave system that they're flying through, and a significant chunk of all the, what are they called, the black tigers got taken out by the enemy fighters. I would like to point out that I have this distinct feeling that that troop carrier in the background of this particular shot is going to be absolutely hilarious. I'm really interested to see how that turns out. Yep, that's pretty much exactly what I figured. So the quote-unquote troop carrier is actually some sort of VTOL-type aircraft, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, kind of like your United States Osprey right now. Only whereas the Osprey has to land and lower a stern ramp in order to disgorge its troops and whatever vehicles it might be carrying, apparently the Yamato's troop carrier can just hover overhead and drop this eight-wheeled armored personnel carrier that makes the M113 look like a piker. Oh my god. This is hilarious. Those walls on top of the vehicle are actually like uh, battlements that the Marines can hide behind while they shoot out against the enemy. I shit you not. This is glorious. I mean, look at that thing. How is that not the most hilariously awesome thing ever? It brings to mind the, uh, the, the, the gun trucks from your United States unfortunate foray into the Vietnam nation a few decades ago, where uh, the, the ground pounders uh, strategically transferred equipment to alternate locations in order to adequately kit out their various trucks with all kinds of armor and weaponry that they weren't necessarily supposed to have otherwise. This thing has that same kind of kit bash thrown together feel and well honestly your gun trucks ended up working better. If nothing else this thing has no like pintle mounted or turret mounted weapons. It's all just sidearms and rifles and nonsense and that's a bad start to a conversation.
Although, speaking of insanity, because it just keeps coming back to more and more insanity, apparently this absolutely batshit sane Cosmo Zero fighter, you know, the one that does like the whole like bendy neck thing and has arms underneath it and so on and so forth, also coincidentally has like this bipedal combat robot built into it that can detach itself and go fight on its own. Because yes, that is totally something I would build into a air, well, a space superiority fighter. A significant chunk of its mass would totally be dedicated to a combat robot. What? Behold, the utter insanity of anime, even if it might be quote unquote live action in this particular situation, although I very much doubt that any of this particular shot is quote unquote real. So, yeah, we, 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 we have successfully achieved our anime roots. Unfortunately, little combat robot was nowhere near sufficient to manage the Zerg rush it was experiencing, and that happy little uh, PDA device that our hero was carrying around for almost the entire movie had an unfortunate end. Of course it did, because no one cares if the AI dies, right? Not even sure it was an AI. Doesn't matter. Had enough of an attitude that it's amusing enough. And of course, it's still worth noting that these coordinates that they're trying to get to were given to them by supposed friendlies. And all they've encountered so far in this entire journey is entities who want to kill them. Man, sure would have been nice for those friendlies that bothered to take care of the infestation they had somehow picked up. Of course, as these things go, it turns out that when the, uh, the actual captain of the Yamato turned over to the acting captain, Hero Boy, he passed on the small secret that the whole story about the anti-radiation device that you humies were going to look for in Iskandar was entirely made up, mostly to inspire hope and some degree of goals for you humies on your way out for all intents and purposes but also because there was that one small hope that since hero boy did survive that massive dose of radiation that should have killed him and all the radioactive matter was cleaned off of him just fine there was the hope that maybe they do actually have that level of technology and yes, in fact, uh, many military operations have been undertaken and many of you humies have died and been killed and killed each other over stories and explanations that were even less truthful and less accurate than a random ass hope. It's just what you do. Now, I suppose the good news in this particular case is that while there is no device that the Iskandarians have that can remove radiation, it turns out that the Iskandarian... Ends. There's a lot of complicated details about the Iskandar and the Gamalus and how they are all connected and uh, possibly the same species and very strange. Regardless, the Iskandars want to help people, humies specifically, and are individually capable of removing radiation from an area. So while they claim they are a more advanced species, I would categorize that under the level of magic, which I guess technically any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from. So yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, at this point, we've already had a combat robot buried into a space superiority fighter that could itself transform. So I have totally lost track of the ridiculousness. I mean, honestly, at this point, the whole like infinite magazine size that the, the Marines appear to have is, is just, I mean, technically that's what Hollywood does all the time. Regardless, this particular instance is just absurdly infinite. And yeah, it, it doesn't even like cross my mind how absolutely absurd the number of bullets that have come out of those guns is because everything else going on in this movie is just patently redonkulous. Anyways, apparently the Humies here figured out the power source for the, the gamblest side of the coin and are going to blow it up because, I mean, that's what you Humies do. Granted, the gamblers are a bit of a dick, but yeah. We had to do the whole personal sacrifice for the greater good thing. We had to do the the Wrath of Khan scene only without the, the glass. Although, amusingly, we do have the radiation, just massively different radiation. And still, after all that, after losing your entire Marine detachment, after losing a entire wing of your flight squadron, possibly your entire squadron, after losing most of your fighters except one remaining one, after losing the troop transport and the troop vehicle and your science officer and your head Marine and all of this, all the time they have spent trying to communicate with the Iskandarians and deal with the Gamalus and all this other nonsense, no one has removed the bomb from the wave cannon 
what were you guys doing up here? I will at least, however, give the artist credit for the continuity of the third bridge still missing from the ventral side of the ship. So at least there's that. And I suppose at least the bomb actually hasn't gone off yet. Strange bomb design. I mean, it's, it's literally designed to plug the hole that the wave motion cannon fires out of. And I'm sure it's going to go off if you were to fire the cannon. But if it's already there, why not, you know, set it off? And, um, but what? 36 crew. 36 crew? Okay, fine. You lost your all your pilots, your entire wing. You lost all your Marines. I still count 12 people on the bridge out of 37 total. You still had like a whole flight deck crew and engineering department and weapons department. And this is a fucking battleship. The original incarnation of the Yamato had a crew of 3,233. Now, sure, there's been a lot of automation advances since the original Yamato floated, but you'd still need a pretty sizable crew to run a ship of that magnitude. Not 36. I mean, there's more space on that ship than you would need for 36 people. And of course, of course, of course, because this is an anime movie and an action movie and fairly predictable in both realities, it wasn't quite as easy as just getting back to Earth. And it wasn't quite as easy as just blowing up the Gamma List's power plant. I mean, yes, there's some concerns about whether that power plant was just powering their planet or was whether it was powering their species. But regardless, it would be absolutely insane not to assume that the Gamma List didn't have some sort of backup power systems on their individual ships or even in their individual bodies if they run off the same power grid system, since they are apparently a collective consciousness hive species. You don't want to drop dead accidentally just because you lose your power connection, right? If nothing else, the species would evolve some sort of, like, capacitor or battery built into them that would retain some degree of autonomy until you could get back to somewhere where you could recharge properly. And if they weren't evolved, you would definitely build them that way. And once again, I am just flat out astonished that the Humies either don't have shields or they suck, and they apparently didn't armor the Yamato at all. I mean... Once again, the original Yamato had armor somewhere between 200 millimeters and 650 millimeters in thickness. And apparently the Gamala's weapons cut right through that like a Centauri going through a bottle of Bravari. It's absolutely insane. So why didn't they up armor it? I mean, they knew how powerful these weapons were uh, based off the engagement off Mars where they lost half their fleet or almost their entire fleet. Why didn't they give the Yamato more armor? Could they not get it off the ground at that point? Well, that's why you don't build ships on the ground, although I guess they couldn't maintain space stations with the rocks being thrown around all the time. Although to back that up, they did actually have space stations, and one of them was actually hit by a rock, so I guess I was right. And regardless, yes, I know everyone was very happy that they got back to Earth, blah, 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 so on and so forth, except then when they got back to Earth, everyone got up from their stations when were like staring out the front windows, marveling at getting back to Earth, and then they got their asses shot. That's why you don't abandon your stations. If someone had been staying on the, the Dratus or the radar or the gravitic sensors or whatever the fuck they use, they would have seen the Gamala ship before it started shooting and they might have been able to do something. Instead, you're going to get your ship shot out from underneath you because you couldn't bother to do your fucking job. These idiots wouldn't have even lasted at Starfleet Academy long enough to get to the Kobayashi Maru and fail catastrophically at that. Oh, well... Apparently, the Gamalists brought a mothership of their own. That's big. Especially given how big the Yamato is. I mean, we know how big the Yamato is, approximately. They made her a little longer to add in that uh, stern exhaust port. <laughs> but um, no, that, that, uh, that's a really big ship. And they appear to have abandoned any pretext of, like, modeling it after a known Terran uh, animal of any sort. Aside from possibly like a biblically accurate angel, but it doesn't appear to have enough eyes for that. Wow. I do appreciate that it does appear to be like a bipedal organism strapped to the front of the massive mothership. I mean, you can see the head and then the arms sticking out and it kind of flows down into a torso. Of course, then it looks like it's a little crucified, which again is kind of strange, but that's a big boy. And once again, if you had been manning your fucking stations, you would have noticed that. 
And then, of course, at the other end of the hilarity, the Gamelus and or Desla and or Iskandar, again, very complicated, not even going to get into that aspect of it, apparently have sufficient power to, like, hijack the broken glass on your bridge and coalesce it into the shape of a face and then communicate with that face. Yeah. If they have enough power to actually reach through your ship and manipulate individual coin-sized bits of broken glass, they could simply reach into your ship and deconstruct it almost bolt by bolt. Then why are we wasting time with this? Or more specifically, why are the Gamelus wasting time with this? Just swat the fly and go back about your business. Although apparently the business is kidnapping the entirety of Earth. Once again, why are we wasting time talking to the Yamato? If you're going to, like, disappear an entire planet, either by destroying it or I think the implication is by literally taking it, the levels of your power are so absolutely obscene that this stupid little battleship is, well, stupid and little. This is taking the classic trope of the bad guy telling the good guy all of the bad guy's plans right before the bad guy plans on killing the good guy. And then the good guy somehow miraculously escapes and now knows the bad guy's plans to a whole new absurd level. We just keep piling on the ridiculousness and the ridiculousness and more ridiculousness. Huh. Apparently a significant part of that Gamelous mothership was for show or it's simply just riding off most of the ship because it, right now in this particular scene, that uh, object kind of in the bottom middle, the lighter uh, forearm looking object just broke off from the rest of the ship and the rest of the ship appears to be falling apart now. Now, again, for a sense of scale, that little small gray line to the bottom right is actually the Yamato. That ship was fucking enormous. And apparently, as it turns out, yes, uh, apparently the Humies were successful in annihilating a significant chunk of the Gamelas, but not all of them. So maybe enough organisms died on the ship that they were riding off those, or maybe the ship itself is dying, and the guy who was communicating with them is driving that pod that escaped, although pod is kind of a, a really inadequate term for something of that size. Great maker. I know, apparently the alien's intention, the Gamelus' intention was to destroy Earth, judging by the uh, the pod apparently being the mother of all nuclear bombs. Big boom. Big bada boom. Oh, wait. I guess the wave motion gun being blocked is going to come up again, isn't it? We have to do another heroic sacrifice scene, I suppose. Yep, called it. And it gets worse from there, because apparently, despite being a space battleship, the space battleship Yamato does not actually have escape pods. In fact, the only way to abandon ship apparently is to load up onto the troop carrier, fly it out of the hangar and land it somewhere, which of course requires a pilot. This rather defeats the point of an abandoned ship system. It should be kind of automatic. It should be dumb. It should be available for anyone to use, not just the pilots. I mean, I guess that's a good way of making sure that you get at least one pilot off the ship, but damn, what if all your pilots are dead, like, kind of like right now? Seriously. There's, like, hysterically bad escape pod systems, which actually we're going to talk about one of those in one of these days, once you guys get enough subscribers attached to this channel. And then there's just no escape pod system, which is also hysterically bad, just in a very, very worse way. And damn it, I still want to know what those big hatches are on the port and starboard broadsides of the Yamato underneath her broadside five-inch equivalent guns. I mean, those are enormous hatches, and the hangars underneath the ship, and the launch system and all that good nonsense. So what are those hatches for? They mentioned uh, launchers being disabled by the Gamelus mothership, and... I, I have to assume those are missile batteries of some sort because I can't come up with any other good explanation because they're not escape pod hatches, apparently, and they're not the fighter bays, so I guess? Also, supposedly Turret 2 was taken out by a gamma shot, and it looks perfectly fine here. Come on, guys. You did so good with the third bridge. Why couldn't you do that, too? Come on, come on, come on. 
Regardless, I would like to take a moment and point out that even if we do use the wave motion cannon to take out the uh, the incoming missile that is going to destroy Earth by nuclear explosion of some sort, blah, 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 so on and so forth, and that's why we had to evacuate the ship, and of course the captain is staying behind to pull the trigger on the wave motion cannon and go down with the ship, because apparently that's something that people still believe happens, regardless. Even if you use the wave motion cannon to destroy a massive nuclear missile of some variety, there's still going to be all that fissile material laying around. I mean, it could be a fusion bomb, but given that they're already picking up radiological emissions from the missile, it's probably fission, at least fission boosted. And it's kind of like the problem of, of using your nuclear missiles to shoot down an incoming uh, meteor or something. You blow up the meteor, and that's great. You, you took care of the one big chunk that was headed towards your planet. Now you've got thousands and thousands of smaller chunks. Hopefully most of them will burn up, but not all of them will. And in this case, when you shoot the nuclear missile, hopefully you will, I guess, atomize enough of the fissile material that it won't actually achieve fission, and then it will burn up as it re-enters but still there's going to be chunks of it left over you're basically going to crop dust your planet with fissile material that doesn't seem healthy now on the flip side apparently the the female pilot is the quote unquote radiation absorbing device she's the current uh, occupant for the Iskandar entity who can just do this magically so I guess if you crop dust your planet with crap she'll just clean it up and go wherever she's going ah gotta love magic i also have to appreciate how absolutely ridiculously slow this missile is i mean we've been like ordering people to abandon ship and people refusing orders and having moving moments with significant others and this that and the other for the past 15 or so minutes in the movie and while the Gamelus mothership was in orbit around Earth, it still hasn't made a whole lot of progress towards getting that missile from orbit to the Earth. I mean, light off the drives and go already. Well, oh, no, I lied earlier. Sorry. Apparently the consoles on the Yamato are, in fact, made of explodium. Seriously, has no one in any science fiction show ever heard of circuit breakers? Circuit isolation fuses for fuck's sake the little screwing things that you use to isolate circuits so this kind of shit doesn't happen but oh no we gotta have the console explode to show that the ship is taking damage because you know the massive gaping holes that are being poked in its hull don't make that clear enough wait a second we're gonna do a force ghost vignette are you fucking kidding me was this movie ever intended to be taken seriously at all in any regard, anywhere, on any level? I mean, oh my God, there's homage and then there's, 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 there's this. Of course, for whatever it's worth, the Gamelus missile that is intending on blowing up the entire planet has defense systems on it. It can actually shoot and it is tearing into the Yamato right now, except like, 90% of the shots are missing and missing wide, which is just fucking ridiculous. You're both on known courses. The missile's headed for the planet. The Yamato is chasing the missile. The Yamato is flying in basically a straight line in comparison to the missile. You just fire down your path. I mean, granted, the, the turrets that the missile has are mounted out at the ends of the arms on the missile, so they have to, like, know their range so they can converge kind of like those x-wing idiot things but still it's a known problem it's not a tie fighter it's not like it's zipping around and dodging and maneuvering and and flying at obscene speeds no it's it's it's, it's plugging along at a battleship speed on a straight line and you can't hit that can we just explain just how fucking pathetic it is that you humies lost against a space faring species that literally cannot hit an object moving in a straight line? I mean, wow. They dumb, but you mega dumb. And speaking of aiming, I do have to appreciate acting Captain Bad Boy's solution for simplifying the target solution for the spinal cannon. You can't miss if you shove the bow of the ship up the stern of the target, right? Kinky. 
And once again, conveniently, the explosion somehow contains itself and does not actually impact the Earth, which is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Once again, that's not how explosions in space work. Specifically, since we are talking about a radiological device of some sort, the energy burst and the gamma rays and the alpha rays and the beta rays and all the x-rays, all the other various names you have for all the other various types of radiation that nuclear bombs release would go out in a straight line from wherever it went off. And wow, I hope there's no one on the surface of the planet on this side of the planet right now, because they cooked. Now, no, we don't actually know that firing the wave motion cannon at the nuclear bomb would have set off the bomb. But again, there's still going to be radiological material scattered all over kingdom come at this point. Likewise, there are significant problems with nuclear bombs in space. They're much less effective than in your atmosphere. I imagine the Gamelus missile was meant to be something of a crust cracker where it hit the planet, burrowed in, and then detonated and basically caused the planet to split apart and fall apart. Although that raises the question of why it was going so goddamn slow. And apparently the good news is that uh, the, the female heron was in fact carrying the entity that could remove the radiation from Earth and seems to have done so, and Earth is regreening itself, its obvious craters notwithstanding. The additional good news is apparently the female heroine and acting Captain Bad Boy did in fact get it on successfully. So, yay for them? Or her, at least. He's interstellar dust at this point. Then, apparently, that's where the movie ends. Uh, I, I just don't even know where to start. I think my reaction can best be summed up by the Felis Caddis being assaulted by the medical officer in the credits afterwards. Something along the lines of, I have no idea what's going on, but I really, really wanted to stop now. I mean, seriously, you go to all the effort of rebuilding an aquatic Navy battleship to get it into space, which let's just ignore how absolutely batshit insane that entire concept is. And then you don't equip it with armor or shields or any kind of defensive systems that appear to work. And you don't give it guns in anywhere other than their original locations. And you don't give it escape pods. And yet you still put in a hangar that flies out the ventral side and a third bridge on the ventral side. And you maintain the stack aesthetics and I... I, mm. And you're telling me that there's not one, not two, but many television series based off this concept and not just this movie, but additional other movies and spinoffs and this and that and the other fucking thing. Man, has anyone ever actually done any kind of scientific studies as to the cultural impact of having atomic bombs dropped on your country? Because it seems like, in addition to, like, physical damage, there's some sort of, like, sociological, cultural scar that leaves behind where things just start coming off the rails in random ways. I can literally just say the word tentacles, and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, Space Battleship Yamato, how does it measure up to the other Battleship movie we have talked about here? Because it makes sense to compare the two, since there's just the two at the moment. I suppose, in some regards, the U.S. Battleship movie got more things correct. Fewer things wrong. More things closer to correct. However you want to look at it. While the Yamato movie just was absolutely batshit insane. It made absolutely no sense. In fact, I think not making sense was one of its, like, director's requirements. Not saying that the U.S. Battleship movie makes a whole lot of sense, but at least there's some continuity there, not just random Deus Ex Machina or Deus Ex Rock Crystal crap going on. So, yes, I suppose you could make an argument that, to me, it is less offensive to convince a 58,000-ton battleship to drift, like need for speed style drifting than it is to try and get a 72,000 ton battleship to fly. 
Either way, make your exploded maze, turn off your brains, because that really isn't too hard for most of y'all, and enjoy the show, I suppose. And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.